Welcome to the uh, session on data from fuel to global scales. Um, happy to see you all this morning. That you still have some gas to go for another another day. Um, I thought I would, uh, before we start the sessions, uh, explain the format and run through uh, what we're planning to do this morning. So um, our first. Uh, uh, presenter Martha Anderson uh, will be using the perspective of satellite monitoring to uh, of water and drought and looking at a large scale uh, view of the world and then uh, showing how we can bring it down to uh, local scales. Um, we have a the session is set up with different presentations to give you a snapshot of different types of data that can be used in agriculture and water management. So after the uh, satellite uh, space view, uh, Dr. Swat Ermax is going to describe his program on agricultural water management of uh, center pivots in uh, large agricultural fields in Nebraska using uh, data as well, using soil moisture sensors strategically located in the field to and how he teaches the farmers to learn how to interpret that data and schedule irrigations, and this way uh, saving energy and keeping uh, water in the aquifer. Uh, then the third presentation in the first part of the session before the coffee break is yet another example of data, but in a completely different type of data that you might have seen before, where um, Mike Farrell, Mike Forsback, and, for, and Ian Cottingham will describe um, the time, the plat based and time lapse project and the focal stream software, a software that was uh, written to be able to manage hundreds of thousands of images that are being collected on the Platte River through 40 plus cameras distributed along from the top of the watershed all the way down to the confluence of the Missouri. Um, and uh, these are cameras that are taking pictures every hour. So uh, another form of data in which we're presently working with them to find uh, scientific applications for. Then at, at the end of each presentation, there will be time for some questions for the individual uh, presenters. And after the three, then we go into coffee break and at the second part of the uh, session, after the coffee break, we have uh, Dave Johnson from LICOR and Stuart Taylor from IDE uh, talking about yet other forms of data. So um, Dave Johnson is going to talk about automated evapotranspiration flux measurements networks. Okay. They have uh, an exciting new software that allows you from your desk to manage a network of weather stations or flux stations and uh, on real time uh, daily basis do quality control and, um, and uh, be able to uh, detect if there's a problem with any of the sensors and that's one of the problems with networks uh, is the cost of going out to the remote areas to do maintenance so this is a way of uh, addressing that problem and then finally uh, Stu Taylor will talk about data that they collected when they worked with African farmers on smallholder irrigation systems and data that is needed to monitor uh, baseline conditions and then um, evaluate how the conditions of a village or of, a, of an area changes with the introduction of te irrigation technology. So that's, uh, that's what Stu is going to be talking about. And I might point out that both uh, Dave Johnson and Stu Taylor uh, are giving the, these teaser presentations but because they have side events in the afternoon. If you want to learn more about them, then you can go and, um, and spend uh, a, f a few hours with them in the afternoon in the side events to learn more. And then uh, at the end, we'll have about half an hour, if all goes well, for a panel discussion. We'll invite everyone up to the uh, um, to the table and then we can take more questions uh, from the audience, all right? So that's sort of uh, the plan. So let's get started with uh, Dr. Martha Anderson. Uh, she has a 
doctor in astrophysics from the University of Minnesota, and, but she's been working with uh, research on Earth observations using satellite uh, imaging systems for uh, most of her career, mapping uh, water energy and carbon and land surface fluxes. So um, very important uh, processes uh, uh, if you're monitoring uh, water use in vegetation and vegetation and crops. She's a member of the Landsat team. Uh, I believe I'm a member of, you, of, of that team of hers as well. And in fact, uh, we've published together in one of our papers on um, scaling up uh, remotely sensed uh, parameters is, is, is one of uh, my highly cited papers uh, with her. So appreciate that. So please uh, welcome Martha Anderson. Good morning. Thanks for uh, joining us here this morning. I'll stand over here. Uh, excuse me. Go back. Okay, so uh, I work with the, agri uh, the USDA Ag Research Service. I'm in the Hydrology and Remote sen Sensing Lab that's located in Beltsville, Maryland. It's just outside of Washington, D.C. And my group and I focus primarily on developing techniques for routine monitoring of water use and drought using satellite remote sensing data. And today I'm going to be talking about some techniques we've been developing recently to fuse information from multiple satellite platforms to produce these products over a broad range in spatial scales, from global scales all the way down to field scales. So the primary uh, quantity that we're retrieving from the satellite imagery is evapotranspiration, or ET for short. It's a very good indicator of crop water use and crop vigor in, in agricultural regions. There is just a growing demand for this kind of satellite retrieved ET information, uh, both in the U.S. and globally for applications in water accounting and in food security. We can use these maps of ET to study patterns, spatial patterns in water use over landscapes uh, to quantify crop water productivity, how much water does it take to gross a unit of, uh, of crop yield. And this gets back to the water productivity and yield gap analysis discussions of yesterday. We can make time series maps of, of ET and use these to study changes in water use patterns over time as uh, in response to changing climatic drivers, um, changing land use patterns over landscapes, and expanding population centers. These satellite-derived ET are important inputs to other kinds of hydrologic modeling systems for predicting floods, droughts, high runoff events. We're also integrating them into meteorological forecasting systems to improve short-term forecasts. And finally, I'll talk about how we use these satellite ET maps to monitor crop stress and in yield estimation efforts. The bottom line is we cannot hope to more efficiently manage our global freshwater resources unless we can accurately measure how those resources are being used, spatially distributed in time and space. So the, the ET retrieval technique that we use are based on satellite drive maps of land surface temperature that we can get from satellites that are equipped with thermal infrared imaging sensors. We know that there's a strong physical connection between evaporative cooling and the temperature of the cooling surface. Wetter surfaces tend to be cooler just because they're evaporating a lot of water. So we can take these maps of land surface temperature, feed them into simple, fairly simple models of surface energy balance and estimate, if we know what the solar radiation load is, how much evaporation must be occurring to keep the soil and the plants at the temperatures we're observing from the satellite platform. We can make these maps over a broad range of spatial scales using thermal imagers from different kinds of satellite platforms. From the continental and global scales, we tend to use data from the geostationary weather satellites like the GOES satellites that are over the United States, GOES East and West, because these satellites give us excellent temporal information. We can get a snapshot of surface temperature in ET every 15 minutes, very valuable for tracing out the diurnal curve in the water use during the course of the day. But the resolution of those sensors is pretty coarse, maybe 5, 10 kilometers resolution. 
So for higher resolution applications, maybe at the basin scale, we might use data from polar orbiting satellite sensors, like the MODIS satellite that is on the, um, uh, the it's operated by NASA. And that's the, the third panel down there. That gives us a snapshot about once per day at a kilometer spatial resolution. But we're finding, especially as I'm working at the USDA, that the demand for this water use information is strongest at the very highest spatial scales that are currently supported in thermal imaging globally and routinely only by the Landsat satellites. And that's the, the um, second to the, the bottom uh, image there. This scale, the field, the subfield scale, is the scale at which water is being actively managed over much of our global land surface. And this is where the demand for the information is. Unfortunately, the temporal support at this spatial scale is not great. If we have a single Landsat that's operating at a given time, we might get a snapshot every 16 days. If we had two Landsats operating at the same time in staggered orbits, we can reduce that to eight days. But if you factor in cloud cover, because these thermal sensors can't see through the clouds, you may get only one or two scenes during the course of a whole growing season in some persistently cloudy areas, and that's really not adequate for defining the seasonal water use. And that's why we're looking into these data fusion techniques, where we're trying to optimally exploit the very good temporal resolution information we get from some of these coarser satellites with the excellent spatial resolution information that we get from Landsat. So just very brief, briefly, this is conceptually how the data fusion approach works that we're using. We can map daily fluxes at continental basin scales using geostationary and MODIS instruments because they have the good temporal information. And then periodically with Landsat on clear uh, days when we have a clear Landsat overpass. We're using an algorithm known as STAR-FM, the Spatial Temporal Adaptive Reflectance Fusion Model, which was developed by Feng Gao, who's another scientist in, in my lab in, in Beltsville. And STAR-FM compares the MODIS and the Landsat image pairs on days when they're both available, develops some spatial disaggregation statistics based on the, the spatial and the spectral similarity between these images, and then applies those disaggregation statistics to the full time series of MODIS retrievals to get the, the, the full uh, daily time series at the Landsat spatial scale. So you can see we're getting some temporal information from the coarser resolution daily MODIS data, but we're getting the spatial structure from the Landsat uh, satellite. We've done a lot of validation experiments to see how accurate these, these daily retrievals at Landsat scale are in comparison with flux measurements taken at many flux uh, sites in the United States and in other countries. This is just an example from a rain-fed soybean field in central Iowa. And so here we have daily ET on the vertical axis as a function of day of year through the growing season, the red squares are retrievals of daily ET from the Landsat satellite. So those are clear Landsat overpasses. And you can see how sparsely distributed they are during the growing season. Um, if we, the, the blue circles then are observations of daily ET collected by an eddy covariance system that was deployed in this field. This is the kind of situation here where we're seeing a lot of benefit from data fusion. In this case, we had a rainfall event that occurred between two Landsat overpasses. If we just apply some simple interpol interpolation techniques to the Landsat data alone, we severely underestimate the evaporative losses between those, those, uh, over, uh, uh, those two Landsat overpasses. And that's the dotted red line there. When we fuse in the daily MODIS information, albeit at coarser spatial scales, we see the response in the land surface to that rainfall event and better recover the daily evaporative losses. So we improve our estimates at the daily time step and also the seasonal cumulative uh, uh, time step. So you can see Landsat only retrieval in the dotted red line in the bottom panel and the Landsat MODIS data fusion much uh, uh, better agreement with observed cumulative flux and water use. A couple other examples of some validation experiments and some contrasting agricultural systems in the United States. On the left, we have an experiment in Bushland, Texas, very arid 
uh, agricultural system in the Texas Panhandle outside of Amarillo, and we're contrasting water use between side-by-side -side irrigated and unirrigated cotton fields in this case. And on the right, it's a, a more humid site, Meade, Nebraska, right outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, looking at rain-fed and irrigated corn. So the model does fairly well at recovering the daily and the, the seasonal dynamics in the water use. It's really interesting to look at the difference in the water use dynamics between these water management strategies and between these climatic regions. Just in the United States, you can see how the water use in the irrigated field in the bottom uh, left-hand panel in the blue in the cotton field diverges uh, much more early in the growing season from the unirrigated cotton field, whereas over in uh, Nebraska, the water use, at least in this year, in these two fields, was much more similar until later in the season. So this kind of detailed water use information at the subfield scale, daily time steps, if we can develop this robustly over a wide range of landscapes in the US and globally, through these techniques or other kinds of satellite techniques, this is going to be incredibly valuable information, both for the growers as they're trying to manage their irrigation applications, if they have widely dispersed uh, land holdings, but also for water resource managers who sometimes have to allocate limited water resources between different competing uses. I'm going to give you a few examples of, of some applications we've been working on for these data, ET data fusion techniques in the areas of water management, in drought monitoring, and some global applications in food and water security. For water management, very valuable for field scale uh, water management. One of the experiments we're working on is in collaboration with the Gallo wine industry. These, these wine grape growers are very concerned about soil moisture and water use in their vineyards. They want to have a little bit of stress on their vines to get the highest quality grapes, but not too much stress to you know, completely kill the vines. And Gallo in particular has to manage acreage all over the state of California. And especially in a drought year like this in California, they're very, very concerned about applying their water and using their water judiciously over these vast land holdings. So they have allowed us to install two eddy covariance towers, indicated by the, the yellow crosses there, and two different Pinot Noir vineyards. The northern vineyard is an eight-year-old stand. The southern vineyard is a five-year-old stand. So we want to kind of contrast water use, these different ages of, of vineyards. The right-hand panel shows a map of cumulative water use over the 2013 growing season. And this was developed with data fusion using thermal data from the new Landsat 8 satellite that was launched in February of 2013. And this satellite is performing beautifully. We can sharpen up that thermal imagery to the 30 meter resolution of the shortwave bands and you can see the spatial detail that you can uh, get from that, that kind of uh, processing. So we can build up time series of these maps and kind of make animations of how water use is changing over landscapes. So this is cumulative water use. You can see in the upper right, on the right hand, there are some orchards that were irrigated very early in the season. These are big water users. There's some vineyards kind of south of the river system. They're very young vineyards. The, the growers are probably applying a lot of water to get those vines established. You can see our two um, uh, Pinot Noir fields there. There is, here are two Pinot Noir fields. There's some alfalfa down here. This is a stand of uh, eucalyptus, low density urban. You can even see some of the gullies in some of the vineyards to the south that have not been vined because they're, they're low lying. And then the background are some natural grasses that senesce early in the season. So just a great amount of spatial and temporal information about land use patterns that can be derived over large areas from the satellite retrieval technique. We're also using these ET maps for monitoring drought. And this is how I got involved with some of the folks at University of Nebraska and Lincoln. Now there are drought indices for every component of the hydrologic budget imaginable for uh, anomalies in precipitation and, and soil moisture and stream flow in recharge to the aquifer. This is a drought index that we've built based on anomalies of, in, in ET, in crop water use. And we feel like this is very tightly tied 
to the actual functioning of the plants themselves. It's the amount of water that the crops are, are actually taking up. So in this case, the red areas are areas that are sh uh, were showing anomalously low rates of water use during the three-month period prior to July of 2012. And this indeed was the heart of the flash drought affected region in the, the Corn Belt in 2012. So there was lower than normal precipitation, but it was exacerbated by just a lingering heat wave, a lot of clear, cloudless, sunny days, just baking the moisture right out of the soil a lot faster than was anticipated. This uh, uh, drought event came on very quickly. It was missed by some of the standard uh, drought indicators. Here's a time sequence of some images of some different drought indicators during the course of this uh, 2012 flash drought event. So we have the US drought monitor over here. We have our thermal-based evaporative stress index, as we call it, or ESI. Veg dry, this is coming out of uh, USGS and uh, NDMC, based on anomalies in green vegetation amount, precipitation, some other indicators. In this year, back in May, we were seeing some signals over the central uh, corn belt back in May, indicating something was going wrong, but there wasn't really much showing up in some of the other drought indicators until a month or two later. We feel like there may be some early warning potential in this thermal-based drought index. You, the plants are depleting their moisture reserves, they're shutting down their stomata, they're not transpiring as much water, the canopy temperatures are elevating, and we feel like we can see that thermal signal somewhat before we see actual degradation, visible degradation in the green vegetation canopy cover. So this is something we're trying to explore is the early warning potential in this thermal-based drought index. And indeed, that, uh, that area that was showing up uh, back in May was the area where the corn yields were most impacted in that year. With the data fusion approach, we can kind of envision a multi-scale drought monitoring approach where we make these maps at the continental scale using the geostationary weather satellites, identify drought impacted areas, and then do some uh, disaggregation, some data fusion, down to finer and finer spatial scales using map modus and Landsat. So we can see how that stress is distributed between different crop types, different land use classes. So kind of like a, a Google Earth for, for drought, if you will. So this is kind of the direction we're trying to to uh, move into. We're currently distributing these ESI maps routinely over the United States, updated every day during the, the growing season. We've done a lot of our evaluation work to date over, over CONUS, and this is where we have access to a lot of flux data, but we're, we're moving now into uh, developing applications outside the US in other countries in collaboration with, with uh, foreign scientists. Just this last year, I had a visiting scientist for a whole year from Embrapa, working with me in, in our lab. And Embrapa is kind of our sister ag research agency from Brazil. Embrapa right now is really challenged by some competing demands, the demand to increase agricultural production, in, you know, to, to feed the growing, growing global population, but also the need to conserve some, some kind of sensitive ecosystems. Uh, kind of diminish the rate of deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. So Embrapa has developed a, a network of watersheds, experimental watersheds over Brazil, where they're looking in detail on the impacts of land use, land management, on water use and water quality, and on carbon fluxes in, in detail. We have made maps with our thermal imaging techniques of, of evapotranspiration at the continental scale. This is a 10 kilometer resolution map made with MODIS data, and you can see the spatial detail that, that uh, emerges even at that spatial scale. Our plan is to apply the data fusion over these experimental watersheds to see if we can really investigate the differential water use between uh, intensive soybean production systems in the Cerrado regions of central Brazil versus maybe some more conservative systems integrated cropping, livestock, uh, forestry systems that are starting to merge in the transition zone between the Cerrado and the rainforest, and also impacts of uh, uh, irrigation as well. So we're putting, we've uh, uh, developed the ESI mapping technology over, uh, over Brazil or over South America. We're putting these out on our website 
as well. Retroactively, we're looking for funding to sustain this uh, in real time. Also looking at connections between the ESI and yield anomalies over Brazil. So here we have ESI maps over a series of about 10 years. And these are anomalies in soybean yields collected by, at the municipality level. And we see good spatial and temporal uh, correspondence, higher yields in areas where less stress is indicated in the ESI, and vice versa for years like 2005. We're working with Embrapa on, on perhaps integrating these, these uh, satellite monitoring techniques into their yield estimation processes. Also doing a lot of work over North Africa, Middle East region. This is a three kilometer resolution ET map that we made with data from the European geostationary satellite, the Meteosat ge second generation satellite. Higher resolution than the, the geostationary satellites we have currently over the United States. Beautiful system. You can see the spatial detail that's, that's apparent even at three kilometers spatial resolution. So you see the enha enhanced evaporative flux over the Nile, irrigated Nile Delta. This is the Gezira scheme in Sudan, irrigation scheme. This is the Sud wetland, which is a major sink of water along the uh, course of the White Nile. These are features that are very difficult to capture using standard hydrologic water balance models. Unless you know a priori that this area is being irrigated, uh, it's, it's difficult to capture. But the land surface temperature is telling us that something's going on there. We have cooler temperatures right there in the middle of the desert. There must be something going on. So we can detect irrigation without knowing a priori that it's occurring or how much water is being applied. One project we're working on is in collaboration with some scientists at KAUST University in Jeddah, who are looking at the impacts of expanding irrigation on, on water supplies there. There has been a rapid expansion of irrigation in some parts of the Arabian Peninsula, as evidenced in this time series of Landsat images over a couple decade period. With the shortwave bands, so Landsat has been in orbit since, a series of satellites have been in orbit since the 70s. With the shortwave bands on, on these Landsat satellites, the visible, the near infrared bands, we can watch the expansion in green vegetation uh, cover amount changes in land use patterns. With the thermal sensors that have also been on Landsat since about the 80s, we can measure the commensurate change in water use that is associated with that change of, of land use. And this is one of the, the incredible values of this Landsat series of satellites, this long record of both land use and water use change that we can derive at the scale of, of land management. So there are some indications that uh, extraction for irrigation is exceeding recharge in parts of the peninsula, as evidenced in gray satellite re recoveries, uh, but also in, in measurements made in wells across the region. So this is a time series of water use information just extracted from these uh, Meteosat-derived ET maps at three kilometers resolution over this irrigated area here. And you can, you can see some interesting temporal patterns and evolution in, in the, the, the water management strategies. In about 2008, there was kind of a beginning of a restructuring of the agricultural systems, uh, moving towards more annual uh, use of water, more annual cropping systems, more alfalfa. And you can see that occurring uh, with a decrease in the first season and an increase in the second season over time. So our collaborators are applying our multi-scale ET retrieval techniques uh, to, to look at, at uh, water use down at, at the pivot scale. We're also working on a NASA project trying to integrate remote sensing data into index insurance programs for smallholder ag agricultural farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. These index insurance programs give the farmers a little bit of resilience to climate, climatic variability from year to year, but currently a lot of the programs are based on some rainfall products or indices that are not so reliable, maybe based on ground-based measurements or some other estimates. So we're trying to tie some uh, contracts to a suite of, of uh, satellite-derived indices, which may be more robust, give sp better spatial and temporal sampling. So we're looking at the evaporative stress index and satellite retrievals of precipitation, vegetation, and soil moisture. And in support of this, uh, some collaborators at Michigan Tech have developed some, some uh, mobile apps where people on the ground can go around and record and geolocate 
information about soil moisture conditions, just visual information, crop conditions, distributed over the growing season and over the region. Very, very useful for verifying some of these satellite techniques. I've got a visiting uh, scientist right now from Tunisia who's looking at yields and ET over Tunisia, supported by the Middle East Water and Livelihoods Initiative. And he's only been here a month, but we're already seeing some good correlations between uh, yield anomalies and our satellite products. This exchange of scientists from other countries to our program has been very, very valuable for us to use their local expertise as to whether our products are reasonable or not in that area, but also develop applications that are relevant to the region. And just finally, at, at the global scale, we're working, uh, starting up a collaboration with UNESCO Institute for uh, Water Education in Delft, uh, supplying global ET products for their Water Accounting Plus uh, project, doing some detailed water accounting in major river basins. We hope to wor work with the, the Water for Food in, uh, um, Institute on these applications as well. Prototype ESI implementation globally in support of global drought information systems that are, are now starting to develop. And you can see the development of the uh, flash drought in 2012 over the United States. But there were also very serious droughts elsewhere in the world at that time. And we hope to automate this and provide this, these data routinely as we uh, obtain funding to, to kind of automate these systems. So in conclusion, just a number of applications for satellite ET. Our main concern right now is continuity in the Landsat uh, data collection program. Landsat 8 launched in February of 2013. We need to be building and, and procuring Landsat 9 to ensure that we don't have a gap in our, our temporal coverage. But funding for uh, routine satellite missions like Landsat is always a challenge. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Martha. Shall we have some questions? Yes, Victor. Thank you, Martha. Um, I was interested in your experiments at Galo with the two vineyards, the young and the oldest. Yes. Uh, could you elaborate on, on your finding there in the sense that you have uh, heavy covariance to measure and your remote sensing estimates? How the they compare and, and was the remote sensing able to detect that sort of very small scale differences between the vineyards? So very good question. And I, I should have included some evaluation results there. We've looked at the 2013 growing season and we do, I mean, the, the measurements show a differential water use between those fields. The younger vines are using less water on a daily basis than the older, older vines. And we recover that dif difference during much of the growing season fairly accurately with the, the remote sensing uh, techniques, we're having a little bit of early season bias. And this is something we're, we're trying to, to work on. There is a confounding factor where they're growing a cover crop between the vines early in the season to suck up some of the early morning moisture, early season moisture. And, and as that cover crop senesces, then the vines start leafing out. And then you have, you have this also this big grass, grassland mosaic in the background that's contributing to the coarse resolution pixel signal. And if we think there's a little bit of a confounding factor early in the season, we just have to figure out some, some techniques that are really kind of specific for the vineyard intercropping systems that, that will help us do a better job for the specific uh, purpose and we want to continue. We, we're collecting data into 2014 and 2015, so we can really see now the, the evolution in the water use through the, the winter and then back into the next spring. And we'll have more information to address some of those issues. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, you'll have more opportunities to uh, ask uh, Martha questions uh, at the end of the session after the coffee break. So our. Our next speaker is Dr. Swat Ermak. Uh, he's got a doctorate in agricultural engineering from University of Florida. Uh, he holds the uh, Harold Eberhard Distinguished Professorship in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at the uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which happens to be the department that I'm associated with now um, uh, in, uh, at Nebraska. He has uh, multiple publications and advises many PhD and MS students. And SWAT, I don't know how you uh, do it. Um, it's uh, quite a, a challenge. 
because uh, he also leads the uh, Nebraska Agricultural Water Management Network, which he's going to be talking about, and that is a huge task, very successful program for which he uh, has just received uh, the, an award from USDA for his work in extension in this program, and he's going to leave this afternoon to Washington to receive the award tomorrow. Congratulations, Swat. So please welcome uh, Dr. Ermac. Good morning. Thank you, Christopher, for the introduction, and, and I want to thank you all for joining us this morning for, uh, for our session. Uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about an integrated effort or program that we have established about 10 years ago to integrate research, science, and extension outreach to, uh, to be able to make an impact uh, on the ground. Uh, to me, any scientific approach, any practice, best management, management practice, any research, uh, if we are going to change anything in a positive direction on the ground, we have to be uh, on the ground with uh, people who are actually practicing those, uh, those processes. So this, this program is about coupling those research, science, and extension outreach to be able to uh, transfer some of the knowledge and data and information to producers and crop consultants and, and, and water managers to uh, to enhance agricultural productivity. I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, uh, my great team members, Brandy, Jenny, Gary, Rod, Dan, uh, and Andy, who was with UNL Extension before. Uh, so, Irrigated agriculture has always been um, a part of human civilization um, since 10,000 uh, BC. Uh, with the Sumerians who initiated or discovered the irrigation or agricultural practices and then it evolved over time uh, with Egyptians developing first irrigation uh, canals, diverting water from the Nile River to their fields and then Romans perfected the agricultural irrigation and municip municipal uh, water delivery structures and, and hydraulics which some of them we are using today, some of the principles. Um, so irrigated agriculture has always been a big part of human civilization. Currently, uh, we have about 800 million acres of irrigated land in the world with China and India leading and the United States having about 55 to 60 million acres of irrigated land depending on the source that, that we use. In Nebraska, I think Nebraska is one of the most heavily, if not the most heavily irrigated uh, state uh, in the world. Uh, we have uh, almost 3.8 million hectare or, or about 9 million acres of irrigated land in the state and here each red dot represents one irrigation well we have in the state uh, with 110,000 at least, uh, maybe more, uh, active irrigation wells. Uh, our, climate, our climate ranges from subhumid from the, on the eastern southeastern part of the state uh, to semi-arid uh, in, the, in the panhandle in the west. Our soil types range from gravel type soils, uh, very fine sandy soils, uh, to uh, heavy, uh, deep seed loam, uh, very productive soils. So, and then cropping systems we have is, is major, uh, major cropping system is corn, soybean rotation, and continuous corn gaining uh, more uh, um, attraction by, by farmers in the last several years. We also have grasslands, of course, and alfalfa and, and many other cropping systems. Now, those challenges, all those uh, extensive irrigation water withdrawal and crop production activities bring some, some major challenges. And, and these challenges, I think, are common for, uh, for many other states in the United States and globally. Uh, at, and I think we are all facing the same challenge. How do you maximize the net benefit of uh, water uh, to, to optimize crop productivity? And farmers are challenged to utilize water resources as efficiently as possible, but also, at the same time, uh, meet the crop water demand to, to, to maintain uh, a very decent uh, productivity, agricultural productivity. So I think some of the challenges, not all, but some of the major challenges can be addressed by 
developing scientific approaches and, and research-based information and data and practices, but also we have to deliver this product to the user. If that link is not established, uh, I think the, the, the success of scientific development or advances uh, may not go too far. So this program uh, was designed to implement technology or technology implementation in, 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 in large-scale production fields, in the farmers' fields, uh, to enhance productivity. Uh, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, we are proud that this network has become the most uh, or the largest and most comprehensive agricultural water management network in the United States. So these are some of the specific goals we had 10 years ago. And, and some of the goals, uh, we add to it over time uh, as the program evolves, but some of the core Core goals are transfer high quality research data, scientific data, uh, and information on soil water measurements and uh, on soil water me measurements and crop water use to the farmers and, and, and help them to, uh, to determine irrigation timing and amount application and, 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 and other practices. Uh, we want to foster adoption of newer technologies and tools on farm um, to, to enable those. those, uh, those specific goals. Also, we wanted to enhance the communication between UNL or the university uh, colleagues and, and water managers and farmers and crop consultants and state and other state and federal water management agency personnel. So we get together, talk about the issues and see how we can work together to, to address some of those issues. Yesterday we talked about uh, uh, that some of the uh, challenges we are facing today are so large for just one entity or institution to be able to solve that issue, so we have, to, we have to work together. Some of our program goals are specifically targeting youth or next generation scientists or next generation farmers uh, and crop consultants, so we have specific programs developed for them. We actually have curriculum for, for that part of the uh, water management network. Uh, and also we want to quantify short and long term uh, measurable impacts in terms of the, the program impact on environment and irrigation water withdrawal and productivity and, and others. These are our partnerships and, and I have several other uh, uh, units that we partner very closely but I, I think I forgot to include those. But, but it is a great partnership with uh, university and, and, and almost everybody involved in agricultural uh, production. So I have many pictures and I'm going to run them uh, through very, very fast. And in some cases I'm going to talk about some of the technical details, but in most cases I'm going to bypass uh, those technical uh, details due to time limitation. Initially, and this is 10 years ago, this was 10 years ago, initially we wanted to have robust, uh, durable, economical, but very accurate tools and technologies to monitor soil moisture. Uh, where farmers can, can adapt those in their, in their practices um, without much hassle. So the system or the soil moisture sensor has to be very accurate. It has to be durable. We cannot replace the sensor every year. It has to last five, six years. The data we obtain from those sensors have to be easy to interpret and easy to incorporate into their decision-making process. Uh, these are some of the pictures from the field. Um, and in, in many cases, uh, these are hand-read sensors. This was 10 years ago, we, um, just keep that in mind. Um, but, but we also included some um, uh, wireless or, or automated uh, data logging uh, systems into, into the network to monitor soil moisture, say, every hour from May or April until, until October. So in the, and, 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 and we also talked about you know, soil moisture, but also precipitation impact on our decision making. And so some of the tools that we, we, we transferred to the farmers uh, include soil moisture monitoring, but also soil temperature monitoring to determine the optimum planting date, uh, planting date and in some cases planting depth for different cropping systems. Uh, we monitor precipitation all at the same time in the same spot in the field. These are different loggers to monitor soil moisture data. Um, so initially we incorporated this uh, 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 metric potential type sensors into our network, but we also promised and we delivered our promise that we will research and search for newer technologies that are durable, better than what we initially uh, implemented into the network. And then once we identify good technologies that can be adopted uh, by farmers, then we will talk about those in our programs and, and then make 
our farmers aware of those new, new technologies and let them make the decision which ones to, to adopt. So we, in my research program, uh, we, uh, we, we, we work with, uh, honestly, with every single type of soil moisture sensor exists in terms of tier, not the, the brand name, but uh, whether it's capacitance type or aromatic potential type, uh, uh, time domain reflectometry, frequency domain reflectometry. So there are four or five different major categories for, for soil moisture monitoring, and we work with every single um, um, category in our research programs. We work very closely with capacitance type sensors and develop calibration curves for those and see how they work in different cropping systems, different soil conditions, and, and, and developing calibration curves for, for different soil types. Um, now, I need to mention this. How do I go back here? Anyway, uh, so we work with, with many different soil uh, sensor technology, including time domain reflectometry uh, from, from Campbell Scientific and capacitance type from John Deere is, is Field Connect. Um, and then we work with PR1, PR2, Profile Probe from, from companies. We have a greenhouse experiment, uh, very extensive experiment that we have. In addition to those, we have six more uh, or five more new soil moisture technology that, that, that we establish soil columns in large soil columns in greenhouse on campus in Lincoln that we, that we test and evaluate those soil moisture sensor uh, uh, performers under different water and nitrogen, nitrogen uh, conditions. The idea is to save time. We cannot do field research from November, December until March in Nebraska, but in the greenhouse we can, we can continue doing research. Uh, so, so we evaluate extensively those different soil moisture uh, technologies. Uh, this is neutron probe, which is the most accurate methodology or method to measure soil moisture content, but it is, it is, it is, it is uh, expensive. Uh, you have to have special license to, 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 to use that, to transport and, and to keep and, and store. So it's, uh, but it is the best method to, to, to monitor soil moisture. The picture on your left is me many, many years ago during my master's project, and then the one on the right is Darren, my, one of my PhD students. We are using exact same technology, in fact, exact same model, Neutron, uh, to monitor or to calibrate soil moisture, uh, to monitor soil moisture in research fields. Back in, the, in my days, at least, I was tasked to plant, to harvest, to spray the field by myself without any technician or students, but, uh, and then set up the siphon tubes from that irrigation canal, surface irrigation canal, to, to manage the, the field. So we have come a long way in terms of how do, how do we, or how we do or conduct uh, agricultural research. The point is, this neutron method was developed in 1948, and it is still the best method to monitor soil moisture content, but it doesn't provide the, automated readings, it's manual, and you have to have access to it to go from one point to another point to monitor soil moisture in the field. These are some of the pictures from installation of those different types of sensors. This is the slurry around the, uh, the sensor to have a good contact between the soil and the, and the soil probe, soil moisture probe. We also talked to our farmers about wireless technologies as newer technologies evolve, we learn about those, we research them, and then we talk to our farmers about them, see how they work, what they do, what they cannot do, and in what conditions they operate the best. This is the wireless uh, uh, soil moisture monitoring system, uh, where I think it's a great concept, great idea, and then we are taking this couple more steps further that we are talking to our farmers, if you want to monitor soil moisture wirelessly, and then have the data either online or, or, or transferred to your iPhone, then, and if you are sharing, or if you, you want to share the same network with your neighbor farmer, then, then the cost or the, the system can be very, very cost effective. Uh, just sharing the, the same baseline or the base unit and then receiver and then nodes distributed in the field with your farmer can, can make this a very cost effective technology. We develop this kind of uh, research-based charts or, or calibration curves to convert metric potential to, to moisture content and then determine available or depleted moisture or, or, or water 
uh, in the soil profile per foot per 30 centimeter soil layer for eight different uh, major soil types in the state. And then at the bottom of the, of the table, we had the water holding capacity values for each soil type. And then at the very bottom, we have the, the suggested trigger points uh, using soil moisture sensors uh, for, for, different major, uh, for different soil types. So it took us about two years to develop this kind of uh, table, but, but the trigger points are based on certain depletion of the moisture available water, water holding capacity to achieve the maximum yield for corn and, and soybean and for other crops. So this is the brain of our, uh, one of the brains of our network. Then we suggest our farmers to keep the soil moisture in certain certain uh, range, uh, and that range depends on the on the water holding capacity of the soil under consider, un, under cons consideration. We also introduce a thermometer or evapotranspiration gauge to mimic uh, the potential ET or reference ET, and then we uh, we develop approaches on where to where to have those evapotranspiration gauges in the field, and then what would happen if you put it in the middle of the field, uh, on side of the field, in different locations, and then what is the impact on the performance. Uh, and we also develop crop coefficients. Every single crop we have on Earth has certain coefficients that we can use those to, to, to estimate uh, in conjunction with potentiality, we can estimate the actual crop water use. So we are measuring crop coefficients for many different cropping systems. We are making them available to our producers so they can calculate the uh, actual crop water use from, from ethnometers. Now, in the initiation of that project 10 years ago, uh, it was a true, uh, it was an idea of true in integration of research and extension and outreach. So one of the first steps was, of course, need assessment. What was needed in the state? So what is missing uh, so how we can we can fill that gap. In our network, the first idea was to, to identify some of the tools and technologies and then, and then identify some great partners. Uh, these are some of my core members in the, in the team, extension educators. And then I educate extension educators about the technology, how do we put them together, how to prepare the sensors and, and thermometers, uh, prepare those. In the initial year, in the first year, we work with 15 farmers as partners or collaborators, and then we wanted to transfer these technologies into their fields. Uh, so we went to every single field uh, and then installed the sensors, teach them how to install them, how to read them, how to interpret the data and incorporate into the decision-making process. It's one-on-one -on -one direct interaction with the farmer, which is still the most effective way to, to educate our farmers on many different topics. Uh, so in the field, teaching. Uh, you talk about many different things uh, in the field and, and then teach the, the farmer about new technologies and then answer the question right there in the field on site. Uh, we are one of the first in irrigation engineering discipline to develop an app many, uh, several years ago now uh, from our, our, our network and it's available online. Uh, we also have a website uh, where we, uh, well before the website, I want to share some impact data from our progress in the last uh, nine, 10 years. So these are the numbers, number of cooperators or partners, farmers in our network. We had 15 people in 2005, and, and as of last week, uh, the number of cooperators or partners increased to 1,340. Uh, so, and as far as I know, honestly, I, I'm not aware of anybody dropping out of the, of the network, but that may be the case that I'm not aware of. Um, our partners represent about 1.76 million acres of land, which is about uh, 720 or 728,000 uh, hectares or so. Uh, so it's a, it's a big area. Now, we also, and these are all uh, feedback or direct impact data that we get from our, from our cooperators. These are not simulated, these are not estimated, these are real numbers we directly get from our, our cooperators. Uh, so the reduction in water withdrawal per season, per growing season, has been about 2 inches, 2.2 inches per growing season. So that will be about 125, 130 millimeter per hectare. Uh, and it is very consistent for the last many years. Uh, and you see the trend line, I, I added that last night, to see the, the progression or evolution of that impact of these new tools and technologies 
that are adopted by the farmers. So initially, until they have certain uh, confidence and experience in the initial few years, uh, impact will be constant perhaps in terms of water withdrawal, a reduction in water withdrawal. But over time, as they learn more about the technology and then we interact more, they have more confidence and then you know, easily interpret the data, uh, then, then their impact uh, increases. So if we are going to incorporate this into uh, the reduction in water withdrawal for the total area, then, then this, is, this, is, uh, this is a big, big number. It's about 370,000 uh, uh, acre feet only in 2013. And then um, I need to mention that uh, this is a very comprehensive network. We, uh, we do extensive evaluation. Uh, we have extension, uh, extensive evaluation process in place. Um, we all, in addition to impact data, we also get some social, uh, not some, but extensive social uh, data. Uh, we have their, uh, our partners' age group, why they choose to be part of our network, and why they chose to stay or remain in the network. Uh, how many acres of land they, 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 uh, they, they farm, and what kind of field type they use, and what kind of crop they produce, their yield, their irrigation water withdrawal. So it is an extensive data set. And the idea that I had was, in the future, if you want to couple physical science and social science, uh, and to, to, to look into some of the scientific or research-based management practice and how they are implemented or adopted by our farmers, how do they make decisions in that transition, uh, so we can, we, can, we can work together with our social scientists, uh, colleagues, to, to, to learn more about that. So since we have the field type they use, and then we know how much, what is the, the depth to water table in their farm field, uh, then we can calculate the energy they use to, to pump that water. So since the uh, initiation of that project, total cumulative number is about $80 million uh, in, 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 in energy uh, cost saving uh, in the last uh, in the last eight, nine, ten years. We have a website. I'm going to pass this very fast. Uh, we share every single thing we do in our network on our website. Um, all of our partners have access to our website. And these are the locations, uh, the cord we have the coordinates of each partner uh, farmer location or the field. And I have been to, to, to perhaps 75, 80 percent of those fields in, in our state. So we used to travel um, extensively to each field to make sure that our farmer understands what the technology is, how to, how to implement this in the field, and how to use it. So we have been in constant, and we are in constant communication uh, with all our farmers. And, and I have to mention, this is, not a just, this is not just a number of people in our network. This, is, uh, this has become to uh, being a great partnership and, and friendship in many cases and collaboration. So uh, we know many of those people, and I know many of them uh, by name. I'm going to pass the uh, website. In our website, we post uh, our growers uh, or partners post their ET information, sometimes soil motion information for different cropping systems, sorghum, soybean, wheat, uh, sunflower, sugar beets, dry bean, potatoes, alfalfa, and so on. I'm going to pass the impact summary because I want to show several slides about research component, uh, research component of, the, of, the, of the network. Um, one of the and we get together several times a year with our partners, uh, talk about what is working, what is not working, how we can improve the network. Uh, we meet in the field and talk to them not only about soil moisture, but, but cropping systems in general. Uh, climate change impact on agricultural production, water resources, evapotranspiration, and, and, and soil moisture. How the crop respond, how the crop respond to, to change, change, uh, change in climate variables. So it is a true integration of research and, and I don't have time to talk about the NEPFLUX, which is Nebraska Energy Water Balance uh, Major Modeling and Research Network, where we monitor uh, evapotranspiration and all other surface energy fluxes, including crop coefficients, soil moisture, soil temperature for many different cropping systems, which feeds our Nebraska Agriculture Water Management Network. So it's a true research-based uh, practice. Uh, so we have 13, 14 towers that we operate for different cropping systems. Uh, and, and each system runs every hour, nonstop, throughout the year. Uh, and then we learn from those towers in terms of evapotranspiration, crop coefficients, 
uh, and, and, and crop response to, to irrigation and evapotranspiration and then transfer this data uh, to our partners, to our, our, our cooperators in the network. Uh, we do extensive research on, on this teal versus no teal cropping systems impact on, on, on hydrology, uh, evapotranspiration, crop productivity. Um, to me, I honestly don't know what the definition of big data is, but, but uh, to me, rather than the, the size of the data, I care about the quality of the data first and also the usefulness of the data. Thirdly, if this data set is being transferred to the user to be able to solve a problem in the field. So this is an example of the flux data uh, from one of my towers, 30 different variables, measure everything on an hourly basis throughout the year for 12 months nonstop, and then one tower can provide 2.7 million data points. But the, uh, the, the, the point is how do, you, how do you interpret this? How do you make conclusions or, or better manage practices, develop practices and transfer this to the user on the ground? That is probably more important than the size of the data. So we developed the crop coefficients for many different cropping systems and, and teach them to, to our farmers, provide them. Uh, this is just one example, no-till versus this-till. Uh, in terms of evaporator losses, reduction with no-till as compared to this-till, and when that occurs and, and how it occurs. Uh, we develop uh, net irrigation requirement maps for different cropping systems in relation to changing climate variables. Climate change will impact temperature, will impact solar radiation, will impact vapor pressure deficits. So that will in turn impact our net irrigation requirement. So what we have done 20, 30 years ago in terms of irrigation management may not be applicable now or, or, or in, in the future. So we develop those maps for different counties, for each county in fact, for long term, and then talk about those uh, to our farmers. We measure crop water productivity for each county and then quantify them for different cropping systems to understand how the trend is behaving or responding to, to changing climate variables. We develop yield response to water functions or irrigation yield production functions, evapotranspiration yield production functions, uh, transfer the, and we do this for each county and for the statewide. Uh, we talk about many different efficiency terminologies, including irrigation efficiency, evapotranspiration efficiency, uh, crop water use efficiency, annual precipitation water use efficiency, growing season precipitation water use efficiency, and others. Uh, dormant season evaporative losses is a big, big component of our water management, um, and, and we measure those uh, losses uh, for each system. We talk to our pharmacy about subsurface drip irrigation, how to manage that as compared to, say, pivot management or pivot irrigation management or surface or gravity irrigation management. Uh, these are some of the pictures from our research sites. Uh, and then we work extensively on center pivot, full irrigation, limited irrigation, nutrient management under those uh, 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 full and limited irrigation management practices. We have extensive research on quantifying crop water stress versus crop water productivity. Uh, relationships, extensive research on variable rate irrigation. Now, the reason I mention all those is because this is a true integration of research and extension and outreach. So every single thing we do in our research programs, our farmers are welcome and they do come and see us in the field and, and we have discussion and idea exchange on the ground. And then when I talk to them about those programs, research uh, data or information, they know exactly where this is coming from. So it's a uh, through integration of the, of the research. I want to acknowledge uh, USDA for initially and partially funding that research or, or the network 10 years ago. And then my research team members, I owe them so much and, and our university. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. And uh, I apologize for exceeding my time, Christopher. Thank you, uh, Swat. And uh, we, in the interest of time, will, uh, you could come and ask questions to Dr. Ermac after the coffee break when we have the panel session. So there will be an uh, extensive time to ask him questions. So let's uh, move along with the next presentation, which is yet a completely different look and type of data. Um, we are going to invite them uh, to come up because they're going to use a different computer system to uh, run. Um, Mike Forsberg is a wildlife photographer extraordinaire. 
uh, focusing much of his uh, career on wildlife conservation stories in the Great Plains. Uh, his photography is internationally uh, recognized. He published a book in 2009 entitled uh, Great Plains, America's Lingering Wild, which uh, was also became a documentary in PBS, which he co-produced with Mike Farrell uh, on my left. Okay? Um, uh, and so this is something you can uh, search and watch, I presume. Um, he's received numerous awards for his photography and wildlife work. Mike Farrell, on my left, has spent most of his career in public broadcasting, specializes in history and humanity documentaries. He teaches at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he's a professor of practice, and of, he also co-leads this uh, Platte River Basin time-lapse project, which we're going to hear about today. And finally, uh, Ian Cottingham, uh, Associate uh, Director for Design Studio and Assistant Professor of Practice, teaching at the Rakes School of Computer Science and Management at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And he focuses on business-driven computing research and the commercialization of research-oriented intellectual property. So uh, take it away, uh, guys. <laughs> This may look a bit like uh, the Emmy Awards, where we're passing the baton <laughs> back and forth as we go through this presentation, because it's very much a uh, very much a team approach. Uh, four years ago, we, uh, my colleague and friend Mike Farrell and I, approached the University of Nebraska Lincoln about the idea of setting an entire watershed in motion by leveraging the power of photography. Uh, as both a tool and a storyteller uh, for education and research, and also to build a template by which we could look at any watershed anywhere in the world. So as we go through this talk, uh, those of you that aren't from Nebraska or familiar with the Platte River Basin, um, these are all tools that we think could be applied to any watershed, large or small, anywhere in the world. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, present at the Water for Food um, conference last year, so what we're going to do this year is sort of look back a little bit from where we've come from and then also pivot forward to where we're, to where we're going. Uh, when we approached the university four years ago, um, they said yes, and we uh, have formed a very wonderful partnership. And they've been a generous funder through the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources and now as well the Water for Food Institute. So this will be a very highly uh, visually driven piece. And we'll start with this image, I hope. Yep. Got no show if we don't have any pictures. Murphy has made his presence made. All right, let's see it down there. Let's get it up. All right. There we go. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry about that. This, uh, this photograph is a uh, tongue of water. It's the first tongue of water that's coming back to the Central Platte River Valley in the river channel after irrigation season. Uh, I was on this river uh, several years ago and took this photograph, and what was so interesting and really beautiful was that as this tongue of water was coming downstream, there were these tiny little fish that were pushing the surface tension of that tongue, you know, sort of, you know, trying to, trying to move it forward. And, and as this water came down the river, you know, birds were coming in to drink and deer were coming out. It's like this Disney, you know, movie. <laughs> And it was true, and, and it was at that point, you know, that you want to ask the question, well, what is the story of this water, and where is this water uh, coming from? 
So where does our water in the Platte Basin come from? Well, first we need to know where the Platte Basin is. And uh, for those of you not familiar, the Platte Basin sits right in the heart of the North American continent and the Great Plains in North America. And uh, we get our water from three different sources. The Platte gets its water from snowpack up high in the Rockies. It gets its water from the mighty Ogallala Aquifer, one of the largest groundwater reservoirs in the world, where the Nebraska Sandhills, which is almost entirely in the Platte River Basin, sits over almost half of the total volume of that water. And then we get our water from our region's weather, where average annual precipitation can range across the basin from eight inches in the west in the range out of the Rocky Mountains to over 30 inches in the more humid east. In 2011, when we began this project, we like to say that the bathtub was full. The Platte Basin um, experienced significant rainfall, historic rainfall, in fact, uh, historic snowpack up in the Colorado Rockies, and together it combined to make the river in midsummer near Kearney, Nebraska, look like this. Then in 2012, someone turned the water off and the basin experienced historic drought conditions. So in 2013, roughly the same time, that same view looked like this. But what if we could see the change take place from that to this? Well, now we can, and that's by using time-lapse camera technologies. The only long-form time-lapse we're gonna show you today is this. You're gonna watch eight months of time unfold on a mountain stream from first heavy snowfall through the following spring. Time-lapse has been around since the birth of cinema in the 1890s. It's been, it was created by George Milliers. If you saw the fictional film, film Hugo, that was based on Milliers' life. By compressing time with time-lapse photography, what would take years to watch in real time can be compressed in just a few minutes or seconds. The result is a new way of seeing on the landscape. And it brings that old, boring physical geography textbook to life and it shows the land as a living and breathing organism. So we wanted to put this watershed in motion, and if you think of it as a big bathtub, uh, we've now placed 40 plus cameras throughout the basin. And you're gonna see these camera locations coming in here. And if you think about it, each camera is a different chapter in the story of that water. These cameras are fed by a solar panel, which feeds a battery inside this waterproof housing. That battery feeds a, uh, charges a controller and the controller takes over the brains of the camera. And what happens then is that each of these cameras take pictures every hour of daylight from dusk to dawn every day, 365 days a year for several years. Our highest camera in the watershed is at Lake Agnes, which is roughly 11,000 feet. The Continental Divide is in the background. Um, that's the headwaters, or one of the headwaters of the North Platte River. The highest camera off of water level is in the tree canopy along the Central Platte in Nebraska at Audubon's Row Sanctuary, overlooking what in the spring is one of the largest roosts for migrating cranes anywhere in the world. And then our lowest camera in the system at the drain, basically, 600 miles away and 9,000 feet downstream from the Lake Agnes camera is here at the confluence of the Platte and the Missouri River near Plattsmouth, Nebraska, just south of Omaha. This is a time-lapse of a time-lapse installation. And you can make your own jokes about how many time or how many minutes it takes to put in a time-lapse camera. <laughs> but nevertheless, what this is looking at is one of these locations. And this is um, at uh, Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge outside Denver, Colorado. It's a location where previously uh, chemical weapons were manufactured during World War II in the Cold War. And what we are looking at is the only permanent water source of standing water on the refuge. This is a picture from that camera taken in early summer 2013, shortly after we installed that camera. And then a few months later, uh, after rainfall, significant rainfall fell on the Front Range, Colorado, causing flash floods, 15 inches of rain, 24 hours. That same image looked like this. Well, when we began this project in 2011, this was the very first camera, picture taken from the very first camera that we installed, this was in February. The camera worked great, taking pictures every hour for about three days. And then a big blizzard hit 
with high winds, crusted over the lens with ice, blew our camera over, and the next several hundred images looked like this. <laughs> and, you know, the sad part about it was is that we didn't know until we returned a month later that that had happened. So we've had many failures early on. We've been trying to figure things out through trial and error and then adapting, improvising, and overcome. Um, and yet these cameras have been taking beautiful images now, cooking along pretty well for the last uh, couple years without us even being, being there. So we've advanced through several iterations of technology. This is what the camera guts look like today. Um, we're using capacitors rather than batteries. Um, and half of our cameras are using cell phone technology that uploads images to our servers every hour in near real time. And in more remote locations where we don't have sufficient cell coverage, the rest of the cameras are sending us an email every hour using satellite technology. That way we have confidence that the systems are working, and if they aren't, we can address them immediately. Now I'm going to pass this to Mike. Okay, now here's where we talk about so what. As I say to my students, whenever you're going to tell a story, you're going to have to have some kind of a so what involved with it or nobody's going to care. Well, as we've talked before, the Platte Basin provides water to one of the most heavily irrigated regions in North America. This river has been long considered over-appropriated and at risk. In the early 1970s, Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska were involved in the second case brought under the Endangered Species Act over the building of Gray Rocks Dam and the loss of whooping crane habitat in the Central Platte, and that put wildlife and habitat at the table when that lawsuit was settled. Then recently, the same states went through a 17-year court battle over the relicensing of Kingsley Dam in western Nebraska. The result was a new cooperative agreement to use the concept of adaptive management going forward which means that they'll apply scientific principles to their efforts and find out what works and what doesn't work, and when they find out it doesn't work, they're going to adapt and do something new. So the Platte is at the forefront of that strategy to use science to find ways to manage the river and to evaluate and rethink the processes that do and don't work going forward with all of the stakeholders at the table. And that image doesn't refer to the stakeholders. <laughs> uh, so what do we hope to accomplish with the photos, with the time lapses, and so forth? Most people cannot answer the question, where does your water come from? What's the journey to your faucet or center pivot or manufacturing plant? What role do humans play in this journey? What's at stake in our decisions? What could we learn if we could see change on a landscape in a new way? Could we build a community around seeing a watershed in this new way? So today, um, we have nearly one million images and counting. Um, with only one exception, we've had no vandalism to our cameras, but we have had some unexpected challenges from nature, like spiders building webs over lenses at a regular basis. We also have some very curious visitors <laughs> that have come to visit these cameras. Uh, but despite all of this, um, I think so far the project has been a success. So one way to use this image bank is to arrange selected images from a given camera location and show you simple time sequences to watch the processes unfold. So I'm going to show you here the snowpack coming on uh, in the mountains. Or we could watch drought settle in on the lower plat in 2012. Or could, we could watch the change of the seasons unfold in the Nebraska sand hills, one of the most um, beautiful landscapes grassland landscapes left anywhere in the world. We could even study wildlife behavior, like watching how flocks of migrating sandhill cranes arrange themselves every morning on the roost, depending on what the water level is. But where this stuff really starts to sing is by taking large numbers of images and putting them together and showing time lapse unfold over time. And we're not looking at time lapses like we do in a movie where you just see the sunset coming on or or uh, you know, the harbor of boats going in and out. We're trying to look at processes on the landscape. What you just watched back there was a restoration from a sand pit lake to a prairie slough. Or watch erosion and deposition along the bank of the Platte River a couple miles below a power plant. What you'll see next here is watching conversion of a grassland that once supported wildlife and cattle on a ranch to a 20,000 unit 
housing development on the outskirts of Denver. These are just snapshots here of larger time lapses that we've been working on for a long time. This is the historic floodwaters from 2011 recede at the confluence of the Platte and the Missouri. This was the major flood that, flash flood that happened in the Colorado Rockies several hundred miles downstream a couple weeks later in central Nebraska. And we can even, instead of doing one picture every hour, we can do one picture every couple seconds and watch a crane roost built, for instance, on the Platte River in one evening. These are wetlands that are hydrologically connected to the Platte River next door at Mormon Island in Nebraska. Seeing the seasons unfold and see the pulse of that water coming and going, that land really breathing. You can even see a stock tank filling up, drawing up that precious resource of ours, the Ogallala Aquifer, to water cattle in the sand hills at the Gudmanson Ranch. And yes, you can even watch the corn grow with irrigation water and a corn-soybean rotation on the Central Platte River Valley. So now we have almost a million images, a team of five people plus interns. Uh, making, when we're making a major pivot from building our wireframe of technology to telling the stories around these locations and trying to build community around the watershed. Uh, what are the next steps? We're taking a three-pronged approach we're working on a PBS documentary that'll look at this basin from the mountains to the plains, from wilderness to countryside. This summer, Mike Forsberg went underwater high in the Colorado to help tell a story of the struggles and the saga of the native cutthroat trout, another endangered species. The cutthroat trout is to the Rockies as the native salmon are to the Pacific Northwest. Their story intersects water use and challenges on a local level with global issues of population pressures and climate change. We're using new innovative tools like anchoring GoPro cameras underwater on spawning beds to watch these fish and capture intimate behaviors seldom seen. Press it one more time. There you go. I don't think anybody's seen this before. The second prong is we're creating learning objects using the same visual tools as we're using for both the documentary and for our basic project. We're using this, uh, creating these for schools under a grant from the Nebraska Environmental Trust. These will bring sophisticated media storytelling techniques combining video, audio, stills, data visualization, maps, and text to bring science and social studies curriculum into the schools and delivered online and matched up to the Nebraska Department of Education state standards. In this example, uh, lease turns mate and nest 600 miles away from that trout story at the other end of the watershed down in eastern Nebraska. Turns are an endangered species who habitat, whose habitats have been lost on the river due to altered river flows. Today, some of these turns are eking out a living, living in a sand and gravel mining industrial zone in a unique partnership between wildlife biologists and heavy industry. So this is the scene behind where those turns are nesting. And then we need uh, we need audio for this. Yep. So again, we're using sophisticated image gathering techniques. These materials will be uh, folded into materials that will go into schools. It'll also go into our documentary and it'll appear on our website. our website slide up now. Got it? Okay. I didn't want to go forward. Well, we're third prong is to uh, develop a website further than the one we originally put up. We're doing sort of more sophisticated uh, attempts at storytelling on that website. We have another video. Can we get that second video up now? This is the opening scene in the... Yeah, water is very key. It's our lifeblood. This is where all your water is coming from. Really, this is the bulk of it. It all begins with a snowflake in three different mountain ranges. We 
live in a semi-arid region. Without water, we have nothing. So that's the first story in our newly launched website that was created by our young team members. And uh, we'll be doing stories on a number of different topics up and down the basin. We think of this project as being essentially an educational project. And so everything we do has an educational bent to it. And there's a very sophisticated way that we can bring the, the user into the equation of helping to understand how a river system works through technology and big data crunching. And Ian Cotting was going to tell you all about that. Let's see if this comes up. All right, it did. Very good. So in the Rake School, our, one, of the, one of the many things we do is, is provide education in computer science and management to students. And, and in doing that, we want to create opportunities for students to, to learn not just how business works, but to really learn how software development can fundamentally change, change the world and change society. And so this was a project that we were really excited to take on. And it, it, it allowed us to experience something uh, more than just crunching numbers, but really experience this ecosystem and how this ecosystem comes to life. And so we've created tools that allow people to explore this massive catalog of image data and start integrating it with other kinds of data to tell a more complete story about what's going on in this ecosystem. And we call this project the focal stream. And it's the website that you're looking at here. And what it does is it takes all of the image data and pairs it with tools that allow us to, 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 discover, new to discover new stories and tell those stories you know, within this ecosystem. And so the website, you know, it, it's uh, imagery is, is uh, foremost in this site. But we have all of the different camera sites, and we allow users to really explore the pictures in those camera sites um, based on what they want to look at. And so we've created some very interesting light table technology using something called the Pivot Viewer that allows us to really fundamentally explore what's going on. And so we can take a look at in Lake Agnes, um, which is a site that I like quite a bit because I think it looks very nice. But uh, we can break this down and look at the different years of photographs. We can see how frequently those cameras are firing. So if those cameras are taking many, many pictures, we can see how that changes over time. We can go through and tag images. So if we want to look for wildlife, we can create a crowdsourcing model for allowing people to, to you know, find what, share what they've discovered in images. And more importantly, we can, com we can pair it with other data. So we can look at the US Drought Monitor data for the period that this camera's reporting and see what the conditions that we're actually able to visualize in the photographs, what they look like in terms of the raw data. And then we can actually explore and discover for ourselves what, uh, what these pictures, what stories these pictures can tell. So this is an example of one of the light tables that we can create using uh, it's a Microsoft research technology called Pivot Viewer. And it allows us to go through, and it'll take a, little, a couple seconds here to load the 6,000 images that are going to be in this set, but it allows us to go through and actually filter based on a number of different criteria. So that's all of the pictures that we're looking at. When we talk about big data, we have um, about half a million images that we've pulled in here, and we generate a separate 300 smaller images for each one of those, and we also mine all of the images for all of their data. So we can say, I want to look at just information for different times of day, or I can clear that off. and. I can sort of see what I'm doing here. And I can look at just different times of year. And so from that, once I've been able to drill in and explore explore how, this, how these photographs exist in different periods, and uh, so I can drill in and look at, say, April, we can actually create dynamic time lapse for the images that we're looking at. So if I want to look at what happened in Lake Agnes over the course of April, I can real time create a dynamic, image a dynamic time lapse movie based on the images that I'm interested in or the story that I want to tell. And we can also pair this with data real time. So as this, Im as this video buffers, um, it's just a series of images, works you know, very sort of old school and very low tech in that we can just swap images in and out and create what looks to be a movie. More importantly, at each one of those stages, we can, we can pull data from on the ground, and we can pull, say, stream gauge data and find out what discharge was in, in the various streams. Or we can pull drought monitor data, and we can see just how dry or arid uh, or wet a region was, and we have the image, a full-scale, high-resolution image alongside that data to very impactfully tell the, the story of that particular environment at that particular point in time. So this will load up here, and we can take a quick look at it. And so we give the user some level of control. So we can watch the data move um, and change over time. We can speed this up if we want to see, you know, there's some snow melting off. We can slow this way down if we want to take sort of a, a more, you know, sort of methodical approach to looking at this. We can freeze frame and uh, then go back and identify other interesting things within these images. 
So from this, we have other exploration tools that we can, uh, we can work with. So when we identify areas of time lapse that may be interesting, we can go through and tag interesting pictures. So a tag that we have in place is people. We can go through images and say, hey, there were people in this image. And we look, can look at individual images and understand at 9.47 a.m. On, on August 3rd what was going on in this area in terms of drought, in terms of water flow. We can zoom in and look at that. And because I identified with people, we can also see that there was evidently a family and some dogs who, uh, as it turns out, people always stand pretty much right at this spot. Evidently, that gives the best vantage point if you happen to be at Lake Agnes. I see people there quite often. And so we have this ability to go through and discover what really can be found in these images. And it goes well beyond with half a million images what any one team even can do by extending this out to the public and saying, here, come, tell your story with these images, share your story with us, and then we can utilize that to, to really kind of crowdsource and create a lot of very inf interesting information. Um, also, we allow people to tell their own stories. So we have logins, so we're plugging social networking into this so that we can really you know, talk about uh, um, sharing this information with a wide audience, and people can create their own time-lapse videos. So I have my backyard here. I go out every, every morning when I remember with my cell phone. I don't have to have a fancy camera with a lot of high-tech uh, functionality in it. I can simply go through and... I should have a button to edit this. I clicked on the wrong button, I think. I go through and actually add images to this, and once I've added images to this, I can generate my own time lapse. I think. And this is the joy of a live demo. This is why we have backups. And so users can create their own time-lapse video tied into the massive data set that we have and share that on Facebook, share that with their friends. And we have a number of other technologies that we're looking to explore and, and to bring to life in this website. Um, so that is a, a very, very high-level overview of, uh, of what we have in the site. Everything that you're looking at today will be live later this afternoon. You can visit it at images.platbasintimelapse.com uh, um, and play around with it yourself and really discover how this ecosystem is in motion and how this ecosystem comes to life. Our next uh, speaker is David Johnson, and he's a senior project, product manager with Lycor Biosciences, and that's in Lincoln, Nebraska, my new home. Uh, he has a background in engineering management and a master's of science degree at, from the University of Central Florida, and he presently oversees the uh, edicovariance uh, production line and everything related to the production of, of those systems, and he will be uh, describing uh, in, in these systems and particularly the network of these systems. So another form of data, uh, Dave Johnson, please. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the latest advances in uh, automated evapotranspiration networks and also about the network that was recently set up in uh, China to do this. Uh, a list of my colleagues are uh, shown here. And so a lot of the talks at this conference have been solving, uh, trying to solve big problems. And one of those uh, is a case study uh, we can look at in Texas where they're trying to understand watershed management. And they've noticed there that they've had a lot of juniper trees, which is an invasive species, get into these watershed areas. And they have extensive root systems, gets down into the water table. And they're evergreen trees, so a lot of, they have a lot of daily water use, somewhere around 150 liters per day. So they're trying to make decisions on should these juniper trees be removed from the system? Is it worth it for them? Uh, you can think about uh, removing uh, junipers from a system like this uh, may cost somewhere around $15,000 a hectare. And if you have a watershed, say, around 4,000 hectares, you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $60 million. So is it going to be worth them? How can they make these measurements and decide that this is a good decision to do? Similarly, with agriculture, you have uh, landscapes with hectares of crops where people are trying to decide how much uh, irrigation to apply, when to apply it, uh, different kinds of fertilizer, which are water, more water use efficient. So how can you get at these measurements? So I'm going to talk a little bit about evapotranspiration. You've heard the term here in a couple talks. 
Evapotranspiration is one of those components. That's obviously when the water uh, goes into the vapor phase. This can come from just freestanding water and also from the soil. And you have transpiration. And now this is the water vapor that transpires from the plants and the vegetation and can change over the time. So you see the water comes up through the plant, out through the leaves. And during the photosynthetic process, you have uh, carbon dioxide that goes in through the stomates and water vapor is released at that same time. And the stomates can kind of open and close and regulate the plant's temperature, so evapotranspiration rates change throughout the day. Uh, this is kind of just a, a crude example to show the, photo, the transpiration process. You can put a, a plastic bag over a plant, for example. Uh, all the water vapor is leaving the leaves and condenses inside the, the plant there, in the bag there. So evapotranspiration is the summation of the evaporation component and the transpiration component. A lot of places, the transpiration component is the bigger of those two. Uh, the rates are usually given in millimeters per time frame, say hour, day, uh, year. And um, uh, this is a typical rate you might see. So the evapotranspiration uh, is shown here in the big picture of the natural water cycle. And this is really important to study. Uh, the water vapor uh, transfer in the atmosphere, say in the lower eight kilometers of the atmosphere, you have about 150 trillion liters of water that are being transported each day, and this is just in the United States. And so what happens to all the precipitation? When the precipitation comes down, uh, the largest component of the hydrological budget is then put back into evapotranspiration. This can range anywhere from 40% to 100%, depending on the region you're in. Uh, typically, though, you're looking at about a 68% of water return back into the atmosphere through the evapotranspiration process. It's really a big percentage compared to even the consumptive use. So now I want to talk a little bit about potential and actual evapotranspiration. So since evapotranspiration is one of the biggest uh, uh, outfluxes in an ecosystem, you want to have really good numbers for this. And there's a lot of techniques out there uh, that have focused mostly on predicting what the transpiration rates are. So you have something called potential evapotranspiration. Now this is what the expected ET rates are if water is not limiting. So assume you have unlimited water and you just look at some variables like a wind, temperature, humidity, and calculate that. Actual evapotranspiration is the amount that's actually abstracted. So it's not dependent on the water, it's what's actually <coughs> being evaporated. You can make a direct measurement of this. Now, the FAO has some guidelines and recommendations on uh, procedures for assessing evapotranspiration, and I'm not going to go into the detail here. Uh, this afternoon, we have a side event, which uh, Dr. George Berba here, one of my colleagues, will talk in great detail about evapotranspiration and making direct measurements of that. But uh, based on these estimates, the FAO even suggests that this is not a perfect method for getting to evapotranspiration. Climates uh, have different changes that are going on, and the equation doesn't fit across the board. Uh, vegetation heights are changing, leaf area index is changing over time, and irrigation patterns, all these numbers can influence the, the, these measurements. And it's really important to have accurate values for evapotranspiration because you can use that, for example, for forecasting when you should irrigate. So when evapotranspiration rates are more than what the precipitation coming in, that's when you know to irrigate. And knowing when to irrigate and how much to irrigate is very important. So here's some graphs just to show some data. Uh, if you look at the top graph up there, you have a plot of the potential evapotranspiration, what's being estimated, and then a measurement of actual evapotranspiration. You can see throughout the day that the actual evapotranspiration is lower. Here's another data set where you can see that uh, around mid-morning, the actual evapotranspiration just comes crashing down. You know, it could be because the stomatas are closing up and uh, it's trying to uh, conserve energy, the plants, but the potential evapotranspiration values are shown there. And if you base those and use that for irrigation information, you can run into some uh, errors in, in how you plan your irrigation scheduling. So the eddy covariance method. This is a, a method that's been about for a, a couple decades now for measuring ecosystem fluxes. And uh, instrumentation and the method itself has been evolving. And now it's used in a lot of research disciplines and across many different applications like the ones you see here. Now, if you go back to that example I said about putting a bag on the leaves to measure uh, transpiration, imagine in Texas, 
if those juniper trees, they were trying to put huge bags over all these trees and measure transpiration. It's just not feasible. And in agriculture, you can't go out here and place bags on these trees. So how do you make a measurement on an ecosystem level over a large field like this? So what you can do is you have a, a gas analyzer and a sonic anemometer. Uh, they're set up on a tower here. And we'll talk a little bit of detail. This is an eddy covariance station set up in a field. And the major components are having a, an analyzer to measure the water vapor concentration, an anemometer that measures wind speed and direction, a biomet system tells you a little bit about the environmental conditions, and then you have some kind of interface unit where all the data comes in and gets synchronized and, and put into the right formats for analysis. Uh, this here is a schematic of the open path analyzer, uh, infrared gas, and the light source goes up from the bottom up to the top. And when the light goes through that sample path, if there's any water vapor there, that water vapor absorbs that, uh, uh, some of that light at a specific wavelength. So the more water vapor in the atmosphere, the less light reaches the detector, and that's kind of a simple way to explain how this gets the concentration of water vapor. Now for eddy covariance, uh, you put this uh, analyzer and the anemometer on top of a tower or a tripod out in the ecosystem of interest. And when wind comes across an ecosystem, it's rolling across in the form of eddies, kind of like waves in the ocean or smoke uh, from a fire. And it's rolling across, and all the uh, wind is coming up from upwind of the tower, and it blows into the uh, instrumentation there. So this eddy uh, is rolling past, and it gets measured, and it has a specific concentration for the water vapor, say 20 parts per thousand in this case. When it rotates down and uh, mixes in with the ecosystem, more water molecules are getting added into, the, uh, into that air parcel because of the transpiring vegetation. And when that passes back up through the instruments, you have a different concentration. So then using some mathematical principles and physics, you can do some calculations and get a net water vapor exchange for that particular time period. So eddies are all different kinds of sizes. Uh, you're making measurements at 10 times a second uh, for these kinds of measurements and computing half hour flux uh, values or uh, getting that uh, water concentration. So for eddy covariance, you measure over a large area like we talked about. So uh, the distance out to how far you can measure in a field or an ecosystem is based on 100 times whatever that instrument height is above the ecosystem. Typically, these are done on level terrain. Uh, the measurements, again, are very fast, 10, uh, 10 times per second. You have an aerodynamic instrument. And these, in, these measurements need to be made 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, year round. So it's really important for the instrument to be robust, to be sitting out there, also to be low power, because in a lot of places these are remote locations where only solar panels are available. This is just a, a simple flow chart of how you get from the raw data all the way around to the final fluxes to get your ET measurements. Now in the past, this has been done over the years in, uh, in spreadsheets and Excel and using formulas. And then more recently, uh, uh, programs like MATLAB and uh, Fortran have allowed people to kind of do this. But at LightCore, uh, we wanted to try and make this easy, easier for people and help get people standardized. So we collaborated uh, with the scientific community, uh, specifically a, a group in Italy, and put together kind of a Windows-based software that does all the processing for you. So you upload your uh, data, all this raw data, and it does all the computations. Uh, there's all kinds of features in there, and um, it's very flexible, and it's very accurate. It gives you the, the numbers you come out with, you can go and analyze and publish your data with. So uh, this is an open source soft software. It's uh, free to download on the website. So the, a lot of the theme here in the uh, conference has been about big data. And so the eddy covariance systems generate a lot of data. You're measuring 10 times per second, so you got about 36,000 records just in, in an hour, 864,000 in a day, and you're looking at almost 3 million records over the course of a year. Now imagine that's one eddy covariance station. Now here's FluxNet. This is a network of eddy covariance stations that uh, primarily are measuring a, a, a CO2, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. So you almost have 700 stations in this uh, network alone, all making those measurements, generating tons of data. And over, you know, new, new networks are coming online all the time. They each have their specific research goals and are uh, in specific geograph geographical regions. So there's tons of data coming in. So I want to kind of shift gears and talk about uh, China a little bit. Uh, there you have 1.3 billion people, 
the environment there is in a, a big crisis, and they're really uh, trying to solve the issues over there. They know they're, they're having some issues, but it's not just the air quality that they're interested in, it's the water. They're having issues with water quality, water availability, and so they're really interested in trying to understand the water cycle over there. You can see here that 62% of the water usage is put to agriculture, and they're trying to feed a large population there, over there obviously, and, and also outside of China. And uh, this chart has been seen in a couple other presentations as well, is that look at the availability of water in China compared to how many people are there. So they're taking, they have a really vested interest in trying to figure out the water cycle and understand what's going on here. So the Chinese uh, Ecosystem Research Network is a division of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and they decided they want to take on the challenge of understanding this water cycle better. And specifically, they want to measure evapotranspiration rates, and they want to do it with the eddy covariance method. So they kind of spent uh, several years picking out different sites all across China, different ecosystems and uh, different uh, areas to try and uh, make a pattern across China to uh, make these measurements. Uh, and then up to a couple years ago, they had this plan, but they didn't have all the instruments and everything they needed to do to make this viable or not. So uh, uh, Lycor and a team of people went over and collaborated with the scientists there and asked, what are they looking for? How do they want? Uh, the data presented, uh, is it, you know, they suggested we want to see things in real time, we want to be alerted to if there's issues at the site, we want all the data in one place, and we want to have different levels of user management. So uh, LightCore went back to um, our facilities and began uh, architecting a new eddy covariance system to work for them. So they have uh, over the 27 uh, towers located across China in a variety of ecosystems. Uh, we implemented the H2O analyzer, the anemometer, and the Biomet system. Uh, the interface unit, again, to synchronize all this data, put it in the right format for uh, processing. But one of the parts that was missing was this real-time on-site computations. You know, typically, uh, like I was saying, you would go to take your data uh, from your site, go to the laboratory maybe after a week, and you process all your data in the software program, and you have your answers. But what they wanted is to have it right away. So the engineers worked on rewriting this program. It used to take about 1,000 megabytes of processing power to do. And they were able to shrink it down to about 22 megabytes. What that allowed us to do was put it on a small computing board. And we located it in a little device like this. Uh, it has a GPS unit as well to help with the synchronization. Uh, this also helps to synchronize uh, several stations in the network. Now this EDIPRO software is running on that little computer board. So all the raw data, those uh, hundreds of thousands of records are going in there. It's running through all the complete processing steps that I showed in that other chart. And then it's giving you real-time, fully processed evapotranspiration rates in this case. So here's a picture of it just installed in the field. Uh, then the remote access. They wanted this data transmitted to, uh, to a place where they could locate it. And so we uh, have an Ethernet output that you can connect to a cell modem, say, a satellite modem, it's like that. And the other major piece that was missing was the software. So how to monitor and man manage all this data? As we said, there's lots of data coming in. So uh, we went about developing a new software uh, tool and a package here. Uh, it's called Flux Suite. This is actually a map view of uh, uh, some sites in Nebraska. You can see we have three towers there. The GPS information is plugged into the map, so it shows up. And then these dots are color-coded, so green means everything's OK. If it was uh, some issues, they would turn orange or red. And you can go to a dashboard view, and across the top you have a bunch of status icons that let you know right away uh, if something's wrong with one of your components. And you can see below that some graphs. So these are actually processed data right there on the instrument. They can look at it, they can see evapotranspiration rates. Every half hour a new point is added. And they can make decisions, for example, if they're on an agricultural crop, wanting to do some irrigation. They also uh, wanted to have a place where they could select specific variables they're measuring and then if the variable goes out of range, it'll send an email to them. So if they're looking at temperature or ET or something and that value exceeds, they're going to get an email and they can act on what to do with that information. And they also wanted to have all their sites monitored and managed from one location. So here you can see a list of all the sites and they can quickly sort, for example, on status and see, okay, we need to do some action on these first four uh, uh, sites. So now to bring it back to the, to the network, um, 
A year ago, September, they evaluated kind of the hardware and the software and everything that came up, and the Chinese government uh, funded the project. Um, and so you can see the uh, sites are all set up here in China uh, across different locations. Um, and then here's just a few pictures of uh, sites set up in, in different kinds of ecosystems, uh, measuring ET from uh, crops and uh, different uh, regimes. There's some rice. And you can see here's some example of uh, data coming from one of their sites. And so that's kind of it. I know that was a quick flyover. And uh, this was kind of meant to be, as uh, Christopher said, uh, we have a side event this afternoon for, in the Grand Ballroom K at 2.45. And uh, Dr. George Berba is going to talk in great detail about evapotranspiration measurements, eddy covariance, how it all works. And we'll have some software and hardware down there. And, and you can come down and ask some questions. We'd uh, love to have you. So thank you. Thank you. Um, as we're going to have them back on the podium in just a few minutes, we'll leave the questions to that period. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Stu Taylor. He's director of IQ Performance Measurements for the International Development Enterprise, IDE. He's got a master's degree in epidemiology and uh, over 13 years of experience with field implementation monitoring and evaluation of economic development and food security data. So I'm very uh, interested in, in, in seeing how you guys do it. Please, uh, us too. Thank you. All right, well, this is uh, one of the more eclectic groups that I've presented at, I think, uh, looking at the lineup before coming in and thinking kind of where do we fit in this. But it's been interesting listening to the sessions and seeing some of the, the lines kind of uh, joining the dots for me anyway, uh, thinking of some of the satellite imagery uh, and the power of bringing greater resolution to some of those uh, watersheds and basins uh, that were in the first presentation, the Zambezi and the Volta, certainly areas where, where we work. Um, also looking at the, the power of data um, in, the, in the second presentation really applied to extension, uh, which is a crucial piece of what we try to do, obviously connecting with very different types of farmers. Um, and, of course, thinking about the power of bringing this sort of time-lapse imagery. Uh, just imagine taking that to a smallholder plot uh, in southern Africa and observing the transformation as uh, micro-irrigation is applied uh, and seeing what happens over time, uh, for just from a learning and from a communications perspective. And, of course, um, we make some use of uh, and are interested in, in learning more about uh, the application of sort of field-based monitoring of, of water use. Uh, in our own work, and certainly working in very uh, data-poor environments quite often. Um, so my name is Stu Taylor. I work with IDE. Uh, and IDE uh, is a, a nonprofit organization. Um, we work uh, in 11 countries uh, across the world, mainly in Asia, in Africa, and uh, small operations in, in Central America. And uh, you know, as I was looking at this session, thinking, uh, you know, everybody's talking about big data. I'm feeling kind of, you know, this is from field to global scale. We're very much at the field level. Um, you know, how, how can I fit in this? Can I give a presentation, big data for small holders? Well, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I think we're still very much, we, we, we're, we are small in many ways. We, we work with small farmers. We're talking about people who are cultivating on generally less than a hectare of land. Uh, when you're looking at the irrigation, it's being applied to often 500 square meters, 1,000 square meters. That's the kind of scale that we're talking about. Um, and so we're talking about very small scale systems. You saw earlier slides of large subsurface drip irrigation systems. Um, when we talk about drip irrigation, we're talking about very small scale, low pressure, gravity fed systems, um, which are sized down to those kinds of, kinds of areas. And we're talking about working with small and medium-sized enterprises. This is the primary route through which IDE works. So we uh, are not out there providing agricultural advice directly to farmers, for example, or handing out technology. But we're working with the markets that provide those technologies, um, trying to solve some of the issues of uh, not just the technology itself, although we are definitely there, but also how does that technology actually get to the farmer? What is that last mile distribution? 
Um, what are the businesses that offer products and services to these small-scale farmers? And what can we do to ease some of the bottlenecks that are there in order to enhance productivity, to enhance income for smallholder farmers, which is really the focus of it. So about the only thing really that is big is sort of our aspirations and what we're driving toward, which is scale. Uh, and so ID's been around for about 30 years, and over that time, um, we've reached approximately about 4 million uh, smallholder farm families. Uh, and you, so you can sort of see the, the variation over time or the, the increase in sort of diversity of the areas that we're in. Kind of started out very much in small-scale irrigation. You can see there's the cumulative buildup there. But in latter years, it has also started to focus a lot more on the provision of the services that go along with that, as well as recognizing we're also solving some problems in terms of rural distribution that apply equally to water and sanitation, for example. Um, so water in the sense of um, point of use, water purification, and also uh, sanitation. And in terms of scale, I mean, this is sort of what ID has been known, uh, known for uh, through its history. Uh, it really got started with uh, large-scale uh, marketing of the treadle pump in Bangladesh, uh, eventually leading to about a million and a half sales in, in Bangladesh, around two million sales worldwide. Um, but where things are at now, we're looking very much at technologies like, for example, uh, the low, uh, low pressure drip irrigation that I was speaking about. Um, and very interested in how, what does it take, for example, to bring low pressure drip irrigation to scale in sub-Saharan Africa. And new technologies, so from the treadle pump to now looking across sub-Saharan Africa, for example, recognizing there's not a huge market for the treadle pump. What there is a huge market for is very small scale motorized pumping. Um, and that's already taking off in the form of gas, diesel powered, uh, low uh, horsepower pumps. Uh, we're also interested in looking at the alternatives in terms of um, possibly affordable solar as the price of PV starts to come down dramatically. Um, there starts to open up space for offering other types of energy sources as well. Um, but when we talk about big data, we're really the small data people still in a lot of ways. This is our platform quite often, uh, that are, certainly that our partners are using, uh, if they're using anything at all. Um, for the data collection, when people talk about the cloud, this is usually what they mean. Um, and so what I want to do is just give you a sense of what are some of the field data that we are working with uh, and, and just delve into a bit of an example from a recent investment. Uh, and so over the last few years, ID has been involved in something called the Rural Prosperity Initiative, uh, which was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and it started in four countries in uh, Nepal, in Myanmar, uh, and then Zambia and Ethiopia, uh, and then went into a second phase uh, which was focusing purely on sub-Saharan Africa and in Zambia, Ethiopia, building on the work there, as well as starting up in, in Ghana, which you can see there in, in West Africa. Um, and we also had a, a concurrent investment going on in India, which I've colored in, in, in gray there, just so you get a sense of the geographic distribution. But this really focused on initially the scaling up of small-scale irrigation solutions for these farmers. Um, but has also diversified, recognizing the need not just for the irrigation technology to get into the hands of farmers, but to deal with those supply chain issues, to deal with the output markets, uh, to deal with the other constraints that farmers face uh, when looking to increase their productivity and to increase their income. So we wanted to, to dive down and, and look a little bit and say, okay, what's actually happening on farm? Uh, what changes are occurring in terms of productivity, in terms of income for, for farmers? Uh, and at this stage, we don't have sophisticated field-level monitoring systems. And so our only choice was to actually go and, and talk to farmers and gather data from them directly. Um, one of the areas where we did that was in, in Zambia. So in, in Zambia, we started out with very much a micro-irrigation focus. Over time, the program uh, diversified out, very much focusing on the last mile distribution issues and has really focused in on uh, private extension services. And that is essentially uh, training up local village-based mobile agents who are able to go out and provide a range of products to farmers, but also enriched with advice. Uh, and that's advice on optimizing the use of the product for production and also how to connect to, to markets. And so that was the basic intervention in Zambia, is going out and, and training these folks, linking them to local suppliers of irrigation equipment, inputs, other things. Uh, to really try and enhance that productivity and income at the farm level. Uh, and so what we really wanted to know was what was the impact of the combination of micro-irrigation technology and uh, the support that was going along with that 
Um, I've used the acronym here, FBA, that's a farm business advisor. These are these mobile agents going out to the, to the farms. And we're interested in overall crop profit. Um, we're interested in both irrigated and rain-fed crop incomes, uh, although the focus here has been very much on irrigation of horticultural products. So we're looking at uh, seasonal vegetable production uh, during, during the dry season. And also looking at irrigated and rain-fed crop productivity, sort of on a per hectare or per, per meter squared basis. Um, now, one of the challenges that we face is that because it's a market-based intervention, we're not going out and saying, let's give that person uh, a pump or give that person a drip system and not that person and be able to randomize that in that way. Um, so we're dealing with kind of a self-selected group and going out and trying to figure out, okay, how do we actually get to the questions of, of attribution and, and, and measurement? Um, and so what we did was we had records from uh, firm level monitoring where we're going out with the firms that are providing these, these uh, technologies and with the agents who are out in the field, they ha are gathering sales information which we then uh, take in and from that go out and visit a subset of, of clients shortly after they adopt the technology and then go to them and gather information from them on their key crop production. And we're looking sort of at a range of variables across different crops, um, looking at things like their uh, seed costs, uh, seed applied, land area, land under irrigation, uh, amount produced, uh, and the amount sold, market prices, et cetera. And putting those together uh, to generate an estimate of both the uh, total revenues as well as the, the net profit that they were earning off it. And then we also went out at the same time and in kind of comparable areas, sort of matched on uh, geographic environmental characteristics, finding uh, some control farmers uh, and then matching them um, using a quasi-experimental design. So we used uh, an approach of, of propensity score matching, which essentially um, is saying, okay, if person A was in an area where they had access to these services, person B was not, um, let's run sort of a bit of a model that tells us uh, can sort of predict what was the likelihood that the person in the area without the service would have adopted it had they been offered it. And then we can match farmers on that basis and generate better estimates of the, what we call the, the, the difference in difference. So when we have kind of a baseline and an end line estimate of productivity and income, comparing those who, who had it and those who didn't allows us to match on those things. Um, so we, we have just some, some basic data from, from these different groups. Um, looking at the change in area irrigated by, by key crop over time. Um, we see some increases among the, uh, the what we call the, the treatment group. Uh, in terms of the actual adoption of technology, I mean, this is also one of the things, because we don't completely control this, obviously there's a number of controls who are also going out and uh, over the, the period of the study also accessing uh, irrigation technology. So um, you can see that there is more technology being used by the treatment group, but it's not... Uh, you know, absolutely 100% in one and zero in the other. Um, and we also asked about hours spent irrigating per week, and we also asked about that by gender. This is a little bit complicated by the fact that we realize that if you ask men about how much time men spend irrigating and how much time women spend irrigating, you get a different story than if you ask women about how much time men spend irrigating, how much time women spend irrigating. Uh, this story is a little bit different on both, which also underlines some of the, the gender-based characteristics of this kind of data collection. Um, in terms of results, what we found generally uh, over the period of the study, the, the costs went up on both sides. That's the red line at the bottom, and then we've got some other costs sort of lying on top. But the, the main red line cost there is fertilizer cost, which was going up over that period and really driving a lot of the cost for farmers. Um, and the uh, treatments were earning uh, more, but the controls actually, not really statistically significantly less. But when you count in the cost, then their net revenues were actually going down uh, over that, that period of time because of the increase in costs of, of inputs. Um, and the uh, piece there up in the upper right I've already, already uh, spoken to. Uh, when we look at the unmatched uh, comparison of revenue, so this is before we do that matching that I talked about, um, you can see visually uh, actually a, an increase in rain-fed crop revenue for the treatment group, kind of maybe a very slight but not statistically significant increase for the, uh, for the control group. Um, and with the irrigated crop revenues, we saw um, an increase among the treatment group, actually a decrease among the control group. Um, when we put this into our model and run it, then we find quite robust and significant impacts uh, on the revenues and on total crop profits um, for that, that treatment group that was exposed to the, uh, the farmer services and technologies. Um, 
And what was interesting was that we found somewhat less significant, but still uh, significant in some of the models, uh, impact on rain-fed uh, crop revenues. Uh, and we're very interested in looking at this further to see what is the degree to which investments in dry season irrigated horticulture can actually spill over into rain-fed field crop production. Because um, obviously that's been a big area of focus in terms of broader food security discussions. Uh, and what we're talking about here, a lot of these, uh, th these revenues are really being generated by your tomatoes and onions and uh, peppers, sort of higher value horticultural products. Um, so we'll go into a little bit more detail this afternoon on some of the, some of the results in our, in our side session. Um, but just to reflect a little bit on the types of data that we're talking about here, this is one particular type of data collected from the farm. Uh, and what we're really interested when we're investing in a particular area is to say, first of all, does the solution actually work? Uh, and I think in, in Zambia at this point, we're moving forward on this evidence and other evidence that's suggesting, yes, this combination of um, enhanced advice and access technology seems to be having an impact on farmer productivity and income. Um, but then how does that change over time um, the type of data that we need as we want to take this to maybe not necessarily global scale, but certainly national scale in Zambia, for example. Um, and the data move from the field to the firm. Uh, and so already we do a fair bit of monitoring of firm level data. Um, but what we're really focusing on now is, is really enhancing our firm level monitoring so that we can see as we go to scale, not just what are the characteristics of arm farm production, but also uh, what are the characteristics of scaling this up, taking this to market? What, what are the constraints there and how do we deal with those? Um, and so this is just a very bad screenshot because I couldn't figure out how to figure, put it all on and I was scared of doing a live demo. But um, we are at this point making use of mobile technologies. This is one of the farm business advisors in Zambia. So our staff can go out, collect information from those farm business advisors. This is sort of the basic thing with the GPS coordinates, you know, you get a photo of the farmer and uh, various information that scrolls down a bit. Um, but then also sub to that, bi-weekly or monthly updates on their business activities so that we can then get a better sense of how is this actually growing over time in terms of uh, farmer services and the enhancement of that. Um, and I'm not a very good marketer, so I forgot to put in the slide telling you to come to our side event. Uh, <laughs> obviously, there's a little bit of competition here, and um, the other guys won. Um, but we are uh, hosting a side event uh, this afternoon. Uh, my colleague, uh, Bob Nanis, who's here, and myself will be presenting some of these results and the implications, how we're taking it. And we have a, a panel together as well uh, with some experts who are going to comment on some of the findings of this report and the implications for how do we take uh, enhanced small-scale irrigation and allied services to scale in sub-Saharan Africa. So please join us. It's in Ballroom J, I think. Be even worse marketing if I told you to go to the wrong place, but I'm pretty sure that's where it is. Thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Stu. You can stay on stage. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, the other speakers to come up and join us. So the floor is open for uh, questions to all the speakers. And by the way, uh, Swat Ermak slipped me a note uh, um, during the last presentation saying that he had to run to the airport to catch a plane to, to go to Washington at 1.30. So unfortunately, he's gone. But uh, we have uh, the other speakers here, and uh, we can have a little discussion on different types of data that you've seen. So please use the microphones. Yes. Let's uh, start off. Yeah. I have a question for Anderson from USDA. Um, I see that the excellent work done by USDA on ET and airport transportation stress index. But I also see that the United States have a lot of drought monitoring system, uh, varying from NASA, NOAA, Nebraska, so whenever we see some, I come from Sri Lanka, whenever we see that a lot of monitoring systems are there, how do you coordinate within United States? That is number one. And how do you see that your information is used effectively by the farmers? Or is it only for the decision makers? Just to make sure. Thank you. No, that's, that's absolutely right. There is a plethora of drought indices floating around. 
And that's kind of the skill of the drought monitor authors to, to look at a number of different indices and try to make sense of that. Each one of them is kind of giving you a little bit of different information. There's some different nuance that has to be uh, factored in. The, the water supply component reflected in the SPI indices, the water consumption uh, component that's reflected in the ESI and soil moisture indices. So it, it's, it's a nuanced uh, analysis that these drought monitor authors are, are uh, very skillful at, but we have to do a better job at kind of communicating with the public as to what the unique value of all these different indices are. I don't think you can make a drought assessment based on one single index. I don't think there's a magic index out there right now. They're working towards objective blends of different types of indices. Maybe that will help to simplify the, the dimension of decision space. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely, there's a lot of information. I think uh, uh, more work has to be done to, to consolidate that information into information that's useful for the, the stakeholders who are making decisions. Uh, I have a question for Stu. Uh, while the next speaker comes to the microphone, what are the the greatest challenges you've encountered in gathering this type of data in villages and with farmers, um, what, what are the issues typically that you encounter in the field? I would say certainly one of the key ones would be when you're dealing with self-reported data on production and on income um, is just the sheer measurement error that's involved in, in doing that. Um, we try to counter that somewhat by triangulating within the, within the surveys, sort of looking at various types of, of data that we're asking for in the same, uh, same questionnaire and put those uh, uh, alongside each other. Do they make sense together? Um, as well as in terms of using this matching technique to say, okay, we know that there's error in the measurement, but is there a reason to believe that the error is going to be biased in a particular direction? when you're comparing the treatments and the, and the controls. And so we try and look at some of the washing out of that. We've done a bit of study of the reliability of um, the recall data with colleagues from, from NORC uh, who had done some estimates on how to do some adjustments on that. But that's certainly one of the areas. And I think it, it really depends on the outcome that you're asking about. And one of the key areas that we really struggle with is actually water use. That's one that is notoriously unreliable in terms of how do you estimate that. And when you're talking to farmers who are maybe running a motorized pump and you have an idea of what the flow rate is and you know the amount of time that it's in use, which is something that they can you know, kind of report on semi-reliably, um, that's one thing. But when you're talking about sort of bucket-based irrigation where somebody's going to a well, carrying a bucket over to you know, some crops and, and distributing it that way, what do you ask? Do you ask how many buckets? Do you ask, you know, so that's where we're actually very interested in how do we leverage some of these technologies a little bit better um, in terms of field-based monitoring and in terms of bigger impacting some of the, the satellite-based imagery and that sort of thing to be able to measure change in a more reliable way over time. Thank you. Francisco, you have a question. <coughs> uh, and it might be open for the, all the panel. From the production chain to the delivery of information useful for stakeholders, we deal with data in the two assets, the tools that we develop and the, there are different company, companies developing similar tools. Uh, to the user, which could be in the research, could be an agency, do you exchange information? Are you aware that the data produced by one company or the other, or the data used, or the collection of the data from a USDA, for example, coming from different instruments? can communicate or flow without any problem, let's say, and put it in a different way, a simple one. Can we talk about apples, apples, pears, pears, when we deal with this data and information? And this, again, from the production to the delivery of information to stakeholders. Who would like to tackle that? Um, Maybe we can start with Dave. Uh, you have a system of network that, that I notice in the photographs might have equipment from some of your competitors. Um, are you, uh, does your system of uh, collection and transmittal of data, is it flexible to include data from other sources? Uh, yeah, because ultimately, you know, the goal is for the researcher to get the information they need. And it doesn't do us or anybody any good to deliver something that they can't use or they muddle through the data or they get the wrong results from. And so we spend a lot of uh, time uh, 
trying to do integration, which is difficult with uh, different types of instruments and the way the data comes across. And so there has to be quite a bit of collabor collaboration even between competing companies and, and measurements. And you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of literature out there that's doing a lot of comparisons of, for example, eddy covariance and like Suat was doing with uh, uh, his soil moisture probes and uh, also like the, the satellite data also doing comparisons with actually ed eddy covariance towers. So I think, um, you know, that's, it's a lot, a lot of this is being done by the researchers right now and trying to compare methods and, and see which one gives the best answers that they can actually use to make decisions with. Anyone want to follow up on that? I yeah. guess uh, the time lapse uh, project is one where data, and now with the focal stream software, data is available online in a, in a package to actually manipulate and allow people to create their own movies, right? You, well, and I, mean, I can jump in on a little bit in that it's, I mean, and your question touches on what I think is probably the single biggest challenge right now of the big data revolution. So we have a lot of data. We have a lot of sensors kicking off a lot of data. We have, you know, massive storage farms that can store a lot of data. But the reality is, is that the data is kicked off in a format that is unique to its own format. And so this is actually a really hard problem, this idea of integration, you know, whether it's integration at the sensor level or integration at the data level. And there's a question about it in the, the general sense session on the first morning, uh, and you know, the easy answer is data standards, open data standards, and shared data standards. And, and that's a good start, but the reality is, is from a software standpoint, when you want to integrate data, you have to have normalized formats. And, and an open standard is only as good as the standard, and its ability to share data is only as good as the programmers who've actually implemented it. And so you know, I've spent a lot of time over my career looking at this, and pretty much the, 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 a problem that has been faced by every single project that I've worked on for the last decade has been getting data into the right format so you can ingest it in your system and you can do something useful with it. And I think the reality is, is from a technology standpoint, we don't have good solutions to this problem yet. And, and, and the fact that we have so much data that we want to interact with is like, I think drive some innovation in this field, but I mean the reality is it's, it, it's not easy. If you can get the data in a format that you're comfortable with and you're flexible enough that you can then ingest the data in that format, I think you know, great, it, 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 everything works really well. And focal stream is a good example. Yeah, we have a lot of data in focal stream. And yeah, we have APIs that you can consume the data with. It, you know, it assumes that we don't change the APIs, that you're satisfied with the kind of data that we're giving you through those APIs. You know, the, the, the idea that there could be an omnibus standard for all data in this domain, I think is probably a pipe dream. And I, I think software holds a lot of potential in being able to make intelligent decisions about, you know, real-time formatting, yada, yada, yada. But I, I do think that we need to see more innovation here. And, and I, I think that you know, funding agencies probably need to really think hard about this and invest in uh, creative solutions to what, it, what amounts to, I think, the single biggest challenge we face with this big data. Thank you. Dr. Victor Sadras, you have a question. Yes, uh, a question for Stuart. From your experience in those uh, farming systems of Africa, would you say that the main limitation is information, that you give growers information and they solve a good deal of problems, or are there other more important limitations? Well, I, I would say there isn't sort of one, one limitation. I, I think that's the thing that we've learned over time. There isn't sort of one key thing that you solve that and that's it, you've solved the problem. And I think, you know, we kind of started at the technology end saying, you know, here's a technology that can make a huge difference. And, and it can. Um, but over time, realizing in the implementation of that, you've got these key kind of areas that key bottlenecks that need to be addressed. So I would say information is definitely one of the key issues, especially when you're talking about introducing something like drip irrigation. Um, for smallholders in, in, in the Sahel. It represents a, a fundamental change in the way that they do agriculture. Uh, for some people, even just doing irrigated agriculture uh, and doing a market-oriented horticultural production is, is a complete change. So there's a huge need for information and support, and I think there are two other key areas of, of innovation. One is, is still, I think, on the technology side, uh, ensuring that technologies are properly designed and sized for smallholders, and the other is in financing. Uh, for people to actually access the services and the technologies, um, there needs to be some kind of credit mechanism in place that is sized down, again, to, to what they need. Uh, and so those are kind of the three key areas that we're pointing at, and which we'll talk a bit more about this afternoon as well, is really the technology, the credit, and the services, which really is focused on that information. How do you enrich that so that farmers can optimize their production and their connection to markets in that? So it's, it's, it's definitely a key solution, but it's not the only solution. 
Jesse, Starita, you have a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Mike and Mike and Ian, one of the things that I appreciate about your project is it's very easy to, for the average person to comprehend changes in water levels and seeing the watershed in motion and um, runoff, snow melt, those kinds of things. But um, how, do you, uh, how do you seek to incorporate the things that you can't really see in the watershed, such as you know, compounds, molecules, things that affect water quality that, at least on a superficial level, are pretty hard to uh, gaze right with the eye. So are you, are you working on that at all? I just, it's funny, I just passed Mike a note <laughs> a little bit ago that said, do you think we can time lapse the water cycle, <laughs> you know, in all of its components from, you know, in the sky to below the ground in a combination of using time lapse photography and data visualizations and other animations? And his answer was authority, authoritatively Yes. Yes. <laughs> sort of. Kind of. I don't. You know. If we I don't, can get somebody to build it. Yeah. We have a graduate student who's doing more or less the same thing you're talking about. Emma Buckley, who's here with us, uh, who was in the poster contest, who is taking several of our time lapse locations in the Central Platte and coupling the the images with data that she's collecting on water quality. She's also using SANS to look at. Uh, uh, bat calls and bat migration, as well as frog calls and frog emergence. Uh, also doing things to uh, correlate uh, uh, pixel colors with uh, uh, the, the when, when plants leaf out and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot of potential within this that has not yet been explored because I guess we're more from the art side of the equation and not so much from the research or science part of the equation. Part of the reason we were excited about coming here is to interact with people who do have uh, imaginations for how to use what we're developing in a scientific understanding way. Yeah, it, your question is, I think, is I think key, and we don't we don't have the answers to that yet, but we're we're trying. And here's you know here's the thing: you can't you can't educate effectively without the science. Um, the science doesn't come if you don't have the funding. And you don't get the funding unless if you can communicate why the science is important. And so those things sort of, you know, work in a, in a circle. And, and some of the most difficult things to, to communicate to folks are, are these processes on the landscape and underground and in aquifers and, and, and in qualities that we can only right now just measure. So if we can move forward and visualize these in a way that both forwards science and forwards education, then, then we're going to be, I mean, we need to do it. We need to do it quickly because our time is short. Um, but I think it's a, it's a really, really good question to lay out on the table at this point. Okay, I'm going to um, go back to Stu and ask him a question on, um, on the low pressure drip irrigation systems. And um, I, I you showed us the treadle pump, and you've also commented on the fact that now there are small motorized pumps. But in, in the low pressure drip system, what sort of challenges do you have with water quality plugging the, the emitters and, and, and that type of, uh, and that type of um, situation? Well, I should probably preface it by saying I'm not a water engineer. So <laughs> um, the actual kind of details of working with the systems has not been part of my part of my work. Although Bob, who's in the room here, could probably answer that question much better than I. Well, Bob is um, welcome to answer. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I would say certainly um, what water quality is, is, is a big issue in terms of potential clogging. I, I'll point to two things. I mean, one is having proper filtration in place. So I mean, the systems come with a, with a filter. Um, that attempts to remove some of the particulate that could clog it up. Um, many of the models that we have worked with are sort of microtube model where you, when you do have clogs, one of the things, it, it has a lot of downsides, but one of the upsides that farmers like is that you can actually just remove the t this little plastic tube and either stick, you know, a, a little thorn in there or just blow it out to remove a clog and then, and then put it back in. Uh, I don't know, Bob, did, is there anything you want to add to that? OK, 
Okay, very good. Um, don't see anyone uh, walking up to the microphones. Yes, we have another question. I have a question to Michael. Um, you have shown about this uh, time series of uh, <coughs> snow and uh, other vegetation dynamics, how it is taking place from the photo shot. But how do we go back uh, 50 years in time of the pictures that are globally available or from universities it is available? How do you geotag that and build a climate change scenario that can be really captured from the landscape perspective? <coughs> Well, uh, you, you want to know about going back in time before we started our project? There are photographic records uh, that, that exist in the American West from the, from the time period right after the Civil War. Uh, most of those were glass plate negatives. Uh, they still exist. They're very high resolution images. Uh, what we don't have in, in that regard is looking at the same place again and again and again over time. Uh, there are a number of photographers today working on what's called rephotographic projects, where you take uh, Carlton Watkins, for example, who was the glass plate photographer that uh, brought Yosemite into the public eye and led Abraham Lincoln to create what was really the first national park. People have gone back and photographed those same places over and over and over again. Um, I think there's also a, a, a potential for crowdsourcing. That's something we're interested in in our project. We haven't gotten there yet. But if you ask people to show you the pictures that they have from their family collections, to show you the pictures that they might make today in the same location, you would be able to create certain kinds of visual records that unfolded over time. And then finally, I think one thing that we feel is, is the potential for our project is that although we're only in our fourth year of this, if you can imagine what would happen if this project were in place for decades and we had these uh, millions and millions of images from a variety of points of view all up and down the watershed over decades of time, how you could mine that for incredible information that we're not imagining now but someone in the future would want to mine. If you go back and look at Nebraska and how Nebraska was settled, there was a, a, a photographer, uh, uh, Solomon Butcher, who used glass plate negatives and he photographed in Custer County, the transformation of Custer County from a grassland to an agricultural system. His, his work uh, uh, documented the transformation to the sod house from open grasslands. And those photographic images are still in the State Historical Society. They're, they're incredible pictures. If you've ever seen pictures of sod houses, chances are they were Solomon Butchers. Uh, we think of what we're doing as standing on the shoulders of people like Carlton Watkins and Timothy O'Sullivan and Solomon Butcher. Well, uh, on that note, uh, we've, uh, the thing is flashing saying that time is up. So let's uh, thank our panelists and speakers. <laughs> and uh, thank you for attending and for asking all the questions and interactions. Thank you. <laughs>